All right, let's get going on this. So you took no notes. I found some notes. Oh. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> well, I'll let you try to run this segment like oh, Vinny does. We've already been over this, Brian. This never works. <laughs> We're going to try. And if it fails, I'll take over. Okay, get ready to take over. Let me do it like Vince. Monday Night Raw. Episode number. Didn't write it down. I didn't write it down. I didn't either. Okay. They're coming to us from uh, Berlin, Germany. This is the infamous German Raw that lost to Nitro by three full ratings points. And uh, Which, by the way, I attribute to last week's show with ECW. That's fair, actually. But um, this was one of those shows that, you know, one of those those shows that's It looked overseas. like primetime wrestling. Right. It's overseas. Not a lot of angles. Not a lot of... Uh, not a lot of um, commentary, or not commentary, but uh, uh, promos or things like that. Just straightforward wrestling show. Lots of matches. Fair? It was a lot of matches. Yeah. Five. So the show opened up, and it uh, had a reminder of the uh, Berlin Wall that was taken down. That did happen. Right. See, this is already not working. <laughs> Keep going. I have nothing to add about the Berlin Wall. All right. The Honky Tonk Man uh, came out and joined Vince and JR at the commentary booth. No yes. no Jerry Lawler. Any reason for that, by the way? No, he wasn't there. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> That's 1997. I don't know where Jerry Lawler was. I don't know. They revoke his... And Honky did a fine job anyway, so who cares? Yeah, that's true. So the first match was Hunter Hearst Helmsley versus Bret Hart. They had a, uh, a fine match. It's funny watching uh, Triple H work heel the way you're supposed to work heel as opposed to the way he worked heel last Monday night and this Monday night. Yes, he was facing a man who knew how to work babyface. And, by and the he way, was also calling the match. This crowd loved them some babyfaces. These poor babyfaces couldn't get down to the ring without being pulled by the fans. Cool. It was, it was amazing to watch the 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 fans just fall over the baby faces pulling on them and 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 pawing at them it was you don't see that anymore Vinny is now sending photos to us right now from hawaii yes he is i just got the same thing that looks cool i guess i'm just not into that part of the island where there's all of the buildings and high rises that's where he went i know and i just said i'm not a fan of that okay i like to go to hawaii where i feel like i'm in jurassic park and there's nothing around but grass and velociraptors. Anyway, where were we? <laughs> That's your cue. Yeah, no, I'm looking at these notes that I didn't take, Brian. This is... I see. You know what I mean? It's well, tell us more about the match. I'll talk about it. Okay. It was a house show match. And then they do all of these moves, all of these spots, and all of a sudden... Brett just threw down the damn referee for the DQ. The lamest fucking finish that you can possibly do. Yeah, the baby face threw down the referee for the DQ. It was very stupid. Brett should have beat him via submission because Brett is doing a submission match in a couple of weeks. But I'm sure Hunter found a way to get out of having to lose via submission. Because he's Hunter. You think he had any stroke at that time? Fuck yeah! Okay. Not a lot, but he had a buddy who did. Fair enough. And then China hit the ring and a bunch of geeks dragged her away. By the way, they insulted this woman on these last two shows. But she looks like a man? Yeah. That was the gimmick, though. I understand that. She was a heel. Right. Yes. That would not fly today. No. There was, there was no one to be outraged on a message board like there is today. <laughs> That's There fair. was no one to start a hashtag on Twitter outraged that this manly woman had been called a man yeah anyway her and her china and triple h left the uh the ring together a clue You're supposed to have an interview with austin austin was in the bathroom what do you think yeah we heard a toilet flushing as they were going to go to steve austin 1997 only vince somehow this is funny no, it wasn't funny at all. Right, but to Vince, it was. Of course. 
But not to anybody else. No, this was stupid. We then had uh, Big Van Vader versus Rocky Maivia. That sound you hear is still Vince blowing up my phone. Dude. This was for the Intercontinental title. Uh, Rocky um, looks progressively better each week that I see him. And to think that I hated this man at one time. You were a sheep. That's true. What I did love is Vader. Vader is so the man. I want to see him work today. Do we saw him. When did we see him last? The Royal Rumble? We saw him very recently. He was not bad. He didn't do a damn thing, but he well, was back briefly. I just love watching Vader throw punches. It's makes me giddy. Vader did a sit-down splash, and Vince said that Rock had made a rookie mistake and paid the price, and then he says, maybe the ultimate price. <laughs> like he might die. He's going to get executed. Vader worked him over, got power slammed off the top. Rock made his big comeback. Old school baby face high cross off the top, drop kick down side, and then Mankind just waffled Rock with the urn for the shitty DQ. Two in a row. Two shit finishes in a row. And then Vader beat him up afterwards. You know, the other thing I loved about Vader is, for a big man, he didn't mind getting hit. He didn't mind taking bumps. Most big men, uh, especially the big men I saw growing up, no bumps. I thought you were going to say, mostly the big man that is talking right now. Well, I didn't like to bump either. Who, who likes to bump? Come on. I didn't mind. I know you didn't. Oh, goodness. This match. Match number three. The Sultan Rikishi, correct? It is Rikishi, yes. Versus Flash Funk. Was, in fact, Too Cold Scorpio. Thank you. This match was pointless. Vince is on the phone talking about ECW to Paul Heyman. And he's about to let him go, and Paul Heyman throws in a desperate plug for his pay-per-view. And Vince responds, all right, hangs up on him. Actually, Lawler actually called in first. Oh, that's where Lawler was. Okay, so Lawler was upset that they showed the ECW highlights on the show. And then, for lack of a better explanation, invited them back. So Lawler was so mad that he was compelled to, on a landline, call Germany from Memphis. I'm sure that was cheap. And then Paul called in and, yes, did get the cheap plug-in. The point of all of this was they paid no attention whatsoever to the match. No. Funk hit a moonsault. Sultan kicked out, put him in the camel clutch, and submitted him. Finally, a finish on this terrible show. And the Sultan was the one that got the finish. Yes. Yeah. Okay, then we had uh, highlights of the Legion of Doom appearing on Shotgun Saturday Night. Which is already, I know you love that show, Craig, but the fact that it's already now just another taping in an arena. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, could, it was doing so, like, it was already done. Yeah, they had, they had like six to eight weeks where they were in clubs, they were in... Um, subway stations and it was had a really cool vibe and then it was just another it was it was the cool vibe event. of we're losing our ass on this production fair enough and away they went to the arena for just another wacky wrestling show i think it was live too as i remember yeah that's fucking expensive right for that i was never a shotgun saturday night fan fourth match was mankind versus psycho sid man you skipped a bunch i did First off, we had a video clips of crazy, angry Steve Austin dating back many months. And everybody should go watch this for those of you. Listen, I'm not denigrating Dean Ambrose here. Let me just say that first. But if everybody thinks that Dean Ambrose is the next Stone Cold Steve Austin, you need to go back and you need to watch Steve Austin in 1997. Number one, he didn't look like a marathon runner. And number two, Steve Austin was a badass. Dean Ambrose, yes, he's very charismatic. He's very entertaining. He does he does great on the mic. But he's not a badass. He's a wacky guy. He's a wacky funny man. Now, maybe if they didn't write him to be a wacky funny man, he'd be a great badass. But there is a 
There is a giant world of difference between Dean Ambrose's character here in 2016 and Stone Cold Steve Austin in 1997. The biggest thing is that Dean takes a good butt kicking and always asks for more. The difference Steve is, Austin kicks everyone else's ass. Right. That's a huge difference. As a heel. Right. And you know what? When Steve Austin turns babyface here at WrestleMania, he is not going to go on a long string of getting his ass kicked on every single show. But I digress. And then we had a Sid promo, which was good, but not the Alamo Dome promo. And then Ahmed Johnson uh, yes. is in the ring with some German fella who was there to interview him and then translate to the crowd. I could barely understand the German guy, mm -hmm. but he was significantly more fluent in English than Ahmed. <laughs> and in fact, when he translated what Ahmed said back into German, it was more understandable to me than Ahmed's promo in English. And I don't even speak German. How did Farouk and Ahmed call a match together? Dude, they had to work it out in the back. I guess. Diagrams and charts and... Did you ever watch Ahmed? That's the answer to your question right yeah. there. Yeah, he wasn't uh, He wasn't very good. Ever. During the Mankind Sid match, Vince said, we finally found Austin. This is 90 minutes into the show or so. About an hour, actually. I know Vince liked his flushing toilet humor, but you know what? When you're in the middle of a wrestling war... You come across so fucking low rent when you can't find a guy. You have the whole thing set up in the back and you can't find Steve Austin for an hour. And then finally like, hey, we found him. Really? Impact? <laughs> he had a great promo. Yeah. He talked about Brett. If he ain't whining, he's quitting. That was a great line. He promised to knock someone's lights out tonight. But he was in a studio with a cameraman. And he didn't beat anyone up. No. Did we talk about Mankind and Psycho Sid? No. No. Sid pummeled Mankind, and Mankind bumped all over for him, including taking a shove into the ring post head first, back of the head first. Um, Brian, help me. <laughs> Excuse me? I told you. They had a match. Yeah. Which is hard to describe. It's very much like your play-by-play. -play. Thank you. It was no good, but it wasn't bad. <laughs> and they worked very hard. And it turned out better than I expected. So I guess that was a pretty good description of this match. That's not bad. And then Sid won with a power bomb. Because he is the champion. Going into WrestleMania. Really miss Vinny tonight. Listen, everyone, I wasn't able to take notes because I had one device and it was to watch on. I could Don't not apologize, take... Craig. You're doing fine. I'm doing horribly. Let's talk about the Bulldog firing Clarence Mason in Shotgun Saturday night. Right. Already in arena format. And then we had Owen Hart versus the British Bulldog, Davy Boy Smith, for the WWE European title. This match was off the charts good. The story of this match is they're both teammates and tag team partners, but they have to wrestle in the finals of this tournament. And it's all wrestling at the beginning. And you're waiting for the moment where Owen just screws and turns his partner, turns on his partner. And there is a moment where Owen sidesteps him, Bulldog goes outside, acts like he hurts his knee, and go back into the ring, and Owen sells his knee... But he's cheating. He's lying. Mm -hmm. And Bulldog backs off, and then Owen attacks his knee. And the fans are not happy with this. And Owen's trying to claim it's a it's a competition. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Blah, blah, blah. Bulldog. I'll tell you about the British Bulldog. British Bulldog. Owen Hart was always great. The British Bulldog in this match was phenomenal. Like the best British Bulldog you ever saw in this match. Mm -hmm. Everything he did was outstanding. He did like... Old school European chain wrestling, the British Bulldog, which I should, I guess shouldn't surprise anybody because he's a British Bulldog, but mostly he just did power moves. Not in this match. Great technical wrestling. 
He did his his kip ups and everything like that. Vince throughout the entire match. There were times where Vince was great on commentary. This was not one of them. One of my favorite spots in the match is Bulldog got the shine early, and Owen came running at him, and and Bulldog sidestepped him. Uh, Owen tumbled over the top rope to the floor. Bulldog, in celebration, did a complete full handstand and a flip and pumped his fists in the air. Not to be outdone, Owen, a few minutes later, on offense, Bulldog's charging at him, backdrops Bulldog over the top rope to the floor, and Owen does the exact same celebration, except the fans hate him. Yes. Vince said, I cannot remember a match where the partners knew each other so well. <laughs> it's like, how about Owen and his own fucking brother, you idiot? They did feud for a long time in your just, company. It was like a year and a half before this. How about Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty? Anyway. Honky was out there doing a Stu Hart impression. That was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Bulldog, huge comeback. Owen with the sharpshooter. People are going crazy. Fights towards the ropes. It's a power slam. Owen kicks out. And finally, Owen goes for a victory roll, and Bulldog sits back on him for the pin. The I, I wouldn't say the best part. The match was the best part. Mm. But after the match, Owen goes and he raises Bulldog's hand. And Bulldog is is going over to the corners to celebrate, and Owen's behind him. And the announcers are going crazy. Don't turn your back on Owen Hart. Don't turn your back on Owen. We know he's your partner, but don't turn your back on him. And Owen's creeping up behind him, mm -hmm. and he's looking diabolical. And then he turns Bulldog around and shakes his hand. It was so great. They were teasing so strongly that he was going to turn on the guy, but he just shook his hand. But you know, as a viewer, that Owen is biding his time. If you ever saw Shawn Michaels before he would um, make a heel turn, he would be just out of line of somebody to where he could hit him with a super kick at all times. It was like that. You're yes, just, you're waiting for it, but they don't do it. But they don't do it. Slow burn. It's the best. So this match was awesome. Uh, go out of your way to see this. It's so, so good. It's the only thing on the show you need to watch, by the way. Oh, very much so. Let's see. Okay, this guy's uh, trying the unnecessary censorship gimmick again. You know, sometimes I'm sorry I came up with that. Hey, this was your idea. It was. Here we go. Like he tried to roll the guy over and he just couldn't him. I see. Yeah. So he goes under the ring, comes out with. Be an interesting DQ. <laughs> I assume that is against the rules. That would be a foreign object. It would be a foreign object. <laughs> but how does it work? It blows. But if I bring a stick of into the ring, it, until it blows up, I haven't used it. So can I blow you? Safely? Not safely, but you know what I mean? I As a assume... performer, can I blow you before I'm disqualified? Hmm. Does the disqualification mean when I See, that's what I was kind of thinking. If, if, if it is five seconds or more, it won't work because you get disqualified because you have a five count. If you have a three second Huh. Yeah. I need to get Regal on this show and ask him. What are the rules of NXT? Yeah. Hey, yes, Craig? Well, that was something. Not waste any time. Monday Let's night. not waste any time. No. <laughs> Raw. <laughs> Monday Night Raw, March 10th, 1997. So I missed last week's show. I was in the islands. But uh, either last week or this week was the debut of the Raw is War theme. And they stopped doing crappy little Manhattan Center buildings and did big arenas with lots and lots and lots of pyro. It was This week was the first week. All right. Jim Ross brings Psycho Sid to the ring for a promo. The deal was Sid tonight was supposed to team with The Undertaker against Vader and Mankind. But Sid knew Taker had a history with those men. He did not trust Taker, so he didn't want to team with them a week before, or two weeks before the WrestleMania match. He said he knew this was a trap. He's going to beat Taker at Mania, and Taker's going to stay in the cemetery where he belonged. So Taker came out to reply. He said, Sid, your logic doesn't make any sense, which I suspect is not the first or last time anyone's ever said that to Sid. He said, if anything happens to you tonight, I lose my title match. But if something happens to me, you get a night off of Mania. So if anyone's going to get taken out, it's going to be me. So no, I'm not going to team with you. You stay in the back. I will face Vader and Mankind by myself, and then I'll beat you at Mania. 
Paul Bearer, Vader, and Mankind came out. They ran their mouths a bit. A brawl broke out. Vader hit Taker from behind, and when Taker turned around, he saw Sid, he saw Sid there and thought Sid hit him. That was the idea. The execution didn't come off that, right that way. It looked very bad and very hokey. Yeah. So that was that. Hell of an opening segment. There were a lot of squash matches on the show, including the opener, head-to-head -head against Nitro, Rocky Maivia versus Cody Hua. Tony Roy. Tony. Or I guess Tony Ra. It's Tony, right? Tony Roy. I wrote Cody, but all right. So. Does it fucking matter? No. no. Thank you. Uh, the entire match was the Iron Sheik, Bob Backlund, and the Sultan coming out and cutting a promo from the top of the ramp. And I know this is the past and, and it's WrestleMania. You think I should remember things like this, but I'm looking at this thinking, Rocky Maivia versus the Sultan was actually a WrestleMania match? That's what they did? Yeah. That was I, their plan? I have a theory, by the way. My theory is that the reason that they had Bob Backlund, the Iron Sheik, and the Sultan come out to rant and rave from the ramp was to drown out all of the die, Rocky, die chants mm, and booing. Interesting. It didn't work. Yeah. But literally during the entire match, they were there cutting a promo on him from the ramp. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that happened. Didn't work as far as distractions go, and Rocky won, and he goes up top with his body press, and he stands in the, he's standing on the top rope, and his arms in the air like Superfly, and Tony Wa is uh, too far away to, to be hit. Yeah, I totally, I so focused on his first name, I butchered his last Tony name. Tony Wa. <laughs> Regardless, I'm thinking this guy's way too far away to rock, for Rock to hit this body press. And Rock launches himself through the sky. You've never seen a 275-pound man fly like this and hits this body press. This is like the coolest thing Rock ever did. It was very impressive. It was easily five-eighths of the way across the ring. Yes. <laughs> it was more than half. Yes. So. Maybe 916. He wins. Sultan and Sheik come down to get him, but he fights them off and goes up the ramp. And as he goes up the ramp, the fans are cheering for him, and he looks in the crowd and points, and suddenly the camera zooms in, and it's Tony Atlas. Randomly. Yeah, he bought a ticket and in the he didn't get a, row. Yeah, he didn't get a good seat. No. <laughs> he just randomly way the fuck back on the floor. The worst seats in the building. Yes. So Rock pulls him up the ramp and they exit together. You know, it's just so funny watching Raw nowadays and then watching this show here and seeing the way that they book their baby faces today as compared to yesteryear. Rock beats a jobber and then he's surrounded by three bad guys. He beats them all up, he slides out of the ring, and he leaves with his head held high. Yes. <laughs> what a novel fucking it's concept. crazy. It'll never work. It'll never, it'll never work in 2016. And they come out to distract him, and he ignores them and hits his move and wins. How will the man get sympathy if he did not lose repeatedly? I don't know. Heavy Metal and Pentagon and Peroth versus Latin Lover and Octagon and Hector Garza. A real match on Monday Night Raw. It's a great match. It really was. Although, according to Finkel, it was... Heavy Metal, Piroth, and Octagon against mm. Latin Lover, Hector Garza, and Octagon. I see. <laughs> Not sure how he feels. One, one of us is wrong. A rare Howard Finkel screw-up. So this was a very fun match, although this crowd had little interest in seeing six men in masks they didn't know. Vince McMahon had no idea what was going on and didn't pretend to have any idea what was going on. He was talking about Taker and Sid. He was talking about uh, Brett and Austin. He was talking about Richard Nixon. And finally, when he was forced to call the match, he said, we're seeing a bunch of, quote, very quick maneuvers. You know, it's so funny because everybody today talks about how Vince is out of touch and he doesn't know what he's doing. And he's he's an old man who's blah, 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 blah. When you watch Vince on Raw, when he came out and just cut the fucking best promo on Shane McMahon, and then you listen to him on this show, and this is the show where he sounds like a 70-year-old man who has no idea what's going on. He's totally lost. He called him, what did he say? I believe he said in this exact quote, what a bunch of matadors. Yes. Not luchadors. Matadors. Matadors. <laughs> he has no idea who anybody is. He has no idea what's going on. He's just, he's like a hundred year old man watching this for the first time. He's so confused and befuddled. So it was his idea for the clone gimmick. And this was 1997. This was 19 years ago. <laughs> this was 19 years. He's 19 years older. So, Brian Pillman did an inset promo hyping up his return on Shotgun Saturday night, and at last, Heavy Metal pinned Latin Lover with Mahastral. 
I thought it was a very, very, very good wrestling match. It was. Hector Garza got in a beautiful twisting dive to the outside from the post. It was awesome. And the funniest thing is that uh, Pieroth could not have been anywhere near this. He just, he didn't even fall. He just let him crash to the ground on the others, <laughs> and he just stood there and watched the pile. All right, another jobber that, whose name I'll probably butcher. Roy Raymond. I, I Yes. How would you fuck that up? I wrote Roy Grievon. Roy Grievon. Yeah. Was he sad? Were we in France? <laughs> Maybe they were in Montreal. I don't know. That's do you, what, do I, don't, you, I don't, How I don't do you hear, watch this? I do not hear Raymond. How do you watch it? On my computer. Like I was just watching it? You have headphones. Yeah. On. But do you see the little dots at the bottom? Yes. If you put your cursor on them, oh, it'll yeah. tell you who it is. That's true. I told so you unless about they that. fucked it up. Yeah. No, I'm pretty sure I could do that. Just Roy didn't. Raymond. It, I don't think it was important enough to get this man's name to go through that trouble. So Ahmed Johnson had more oil on his body here. Yes. Than in the entire Exxon Valdez spill. He was dipped in a vat of oil. <laughs> He's whipping. Actually, this is how it went. Raymond jumped him at the bell. He was whipping Ahmed Johnson's ass. When the Nation of Domination apparently came out to distract him. And this spurred Ahmed to action. When the Nation came out, he was inspired. He whipped Raymond's ass and won with a Pearl River plunge. Well, he was inspired because the music was playing throughout the match. The Nation of Domination song. Which makes everything better. It is awesome. So Ahmed wins. Uh, the Nation... Farouk then gets a promo. He said... <laughs> He used terminology like calling Farouk and uh, calling Ahmed and Uncle Tom. We had Uncle Tom, black ass, and gangsta style. And charcoal colored punk. Yes. A lot of uncomfortable dialogue here. Very awkward. It's like being at Wood's house. You can only imagine what Ahmed called him, but I have no idea because <laughs> I can't understand a word he says. And he was actually much more articulate than usual. And I still couldn't understand anything. He said Farouk had a nation, so he had gone out and found the two baddest men he could find and brought out the Road Warriors. He said he found the baddest men in Chicago. Yeah. Because Mania's in Chicago. Yes. So Farouk has a nation. He's got two dudes in a city. Yeah, that's what you're, he said. You're unimpressed. <laughs> I am very unimpressed. Yeah. Especially after their match with the Godwins. Yeah, well, there's that. So they came out through the crowd, which was a better idea on paper than an execution, because the camera never found them until they actually got to ringside. Which is hard to believe, given those goddamn spikes. <laughs> They're just listen to fans screaming. They're 280 pound men in giant spiked shoulder pads, and they couldn't find them. So they, then they cut a promo. Hawk vowed to leave the nation looking like, quote, a sweaty, fly-covered pile of raw sweat socks. That's a new one. And we'll talk about the reaction they had gotten and how the nation should be intimidated, and that was that. That was a fun promo. Owen and Bulldog versus the Blackjacks. They showed Davy Boy beating Owen in the European Championship Finals last week. Then Ross tried to interview them, but Owen blew him off saying, look, it doesn't matter how I almost beat Bulldog last week. The important thing is we have a tag match right now. Owen was great, in case any of you have forgotten. It was funny because, because Owen, first off, the very first thing that Owen does is he cuts off Gene. Because he wants to talk about himself, and Gene's trying to interview Bulldog. Jim. What do you mean Jim? It's not Gene. Oh, yeah, sorry, Jim Ross. Yeah. So he cuts him off, blah, blah, blah. So he wants to make it all about him, but then Jim Ross starts trying to stir shit. And Owen deflects it and just says, leave us alone. So there in the ring, the Blackjacks come out. The Blackjacks looked at least nine feet tall next to these men. Also trying to stir shit. Yeah. They did, an, they did a promo. If this had been facing the camera with a podium and Tony Schiavone, this would look exactly like 1986 NWA Championship Wrestling. Two big cowboys. Talking about how oh, how great Owen and Bulldog are, all they've accomplished, but you're not in our class. And they start running down Owen and say they're they're needling him. And JBL finally says he's got a pretty mouth, and a brawl breaks out. So it's a tag match. We get an inset promo from Vader, Mankind, and Paul Bearer, where Vader did literally all the talking, and it was funny. It's not like it was a bad promo; it was a perfectly fine promo. But he just kept going and wouldn't shut up. To the point where even Vince was like, yes, yes, it's Vader time. You know, <laughs> he did just kind of cut him off. Yes. It's funny because this 1997 WrestleMania, aside from the great I Quit match, this was not a very good WrestleMania. No. 
and it certainly did not do good business at all. But as I watched this Raw, they did a way better job building up this WrestleMania than the one we're about to get this year. At least they've got matches. We still don't know <laughs> half the matches for this fucking WrestleMania. And they could all change on Saturday. You know, I was looking at a non-wrestling site today, and an ad popped up. And, of course, the ad knows, ad thing knows I'm a wrestling fan. And it's a WrestleMania ad, and it's Taker and Shane. And I just looked at it, and I looked at it, and I looked at it. I shook my head, and I went on with my day. But that's, that's what they think people want to see. Well, hey, there are a lot of people that want to see it. They're just a lot younger than you and me. I guess so. And maybe that's changed now that they've seen him throw punches <laughs> at security. Perhaps. Oh, wait till you see that. Just wait, Vinny. <laughs> You've never seen so many zooms and camera cuts in a single segment in your whole entire life. When they weren't bad punches, they were potatoing the guy. Um, I suspect all of them were potatoing the guys. No. No? <laughs> it's hard so, to potato a guy when you miss by eight feet. Valid, yeah. yeah. Only to be... Uh, only to be made looked worse when he's throwing knee strikes yeah remember that one time kane hit shane <laughs> that was awesome <laughs> i do remember that <laughs> the best thing kane ever did slapped and he, he just did this giant lunge like i will get you motherfucker <laughs> i don't care if you're a mile away i'm gonna get you yes. and he did god filthy was right <laughs> he was he does deserve to be in the hall of fame yeah just for that during this year tag match they randomly randomly announced next week a week before mania Bret Hart versus Psycho Sid in a steel cage for the championship. The crowd was absolutely dead for this match. Bulldog had a spectacular match last week. This week didn't look so good. It's also funny. It's ironic because when they announced Bret versus Sid, Vince on commentary is going crazy about how this could change the entire WrestleMania card. Nothing like this has ever happened before. And I'm thinking, I'm watching it right fucking now in 2016. The same thing. Yeah, except that's their plan. Yeah. <laughs> so... We also got an inset promo from Taz threatening Jerry Lawler, hyping up the debate later in the show. If this sounds like an epileptic show, it's because it is. It really is. Going back over this, this is all happening in one segment. So I enjoyed this match, actually. It, it was two heel teams, so the crowd didn't care much, but I thought they worked hard, went back and forth, and it was fun. So Owen makes his comeback. He hooks Bradshaw on the sharpshooter, but Bulldog and Wyndham are brawling, and Bulldog throws the ref down, drawing the DQ. The announcers had no idea what was going on or why it was a disqualification, but I did, so that's fine. So, more dissension between Owen and Bulldog. After the break, Taz comes out to confront Lawler. They're going. They're actually grabbing each other by the collar. Sabu hits the ring and tries to hit a dive onto both men. They both dodge, and Sabu goes through a table. <laughs> just like, I know they just wanted to do a table spot, and it's supposed to be hardcore, but... In hindsight, looking back at this, he looked like such a fucking numbskull. He looked like a goof. He runs out for a big spot, the dude moves, and he just crashes and burns, and he's a dead man. Yes. And dudes come out to cart his body away. The Eliminators and Chris Candido take him away, or they took Taz away. Tommy Dreamer, Sandman, and Heyman tend to Sabu. Lawler goes back to his desk, and in his mind, this is all a huge victory. Well, it kind of was. I guess so. Leaf Cassidy versus Miguel Perez. I have notes here, but it doesn't matter. Cassidy tried to powerbomb. Perez escaped. Hit he body scissors a cradle for the win. Who's hairier, Big Wood or Miguel Perez? Miguel Perez by a wide margin. Yeah. You know, I got to give uh, Perez some credit. This was not his best match, but we have seen some very, very impressive Miguel Perez matches. And he is a great example of a guy who clearly, God bless him, was not a great athlete. He couldn't jump very high. He wasn't very flexible. He wasn't very fast. But goddamn, did he overachieve. He was a good little worker, and he did crazy stuff. He'd do these leapfrogs, and he'd barely clear the guy. But you know what? He cleared the guy. He didn't need an extra five inches over the guy's head. His cock needed an inch over the guy's head, and he achieved. Wow. So good job, Miguel Perez. You just said that. Yeah, he did. I was watching Dude, this. Dude, I've been talking about Hulk Hogan's cock all day. Yeah, okay. This is yeah. the least of our problems. Yeah. I don't envy you today. I was watching this match, and my wife came in, looked at the screen, and he goes, she goes, uh, is that Al Snow? I said, yes, dear, that is Al Snow. Huh. Wouldn't have had her day. Yeah. That's the reaction to all Al Snow matches, I believe. I got a tape for her. Yeah. <laughs> Sid did a backstage promo. Randy By the way, was Perez's music a Shakira ripoff, or is it just me? I... 
Sure. I've never listened to Shakira. Yeah, you have. She no. would have been six you, don't, you don't have to listen to it. If you've ever listened to the radio, you've heard a Shakira song, especially this one. Hips Don't Lie, I believe it was. She would have been, I believe, six or something when this happened. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe Similar. they added it in today. What That's the hell possible. was his original music? I don't know. Maybe it wasn't Hips. Why are you looking for it? Because she's hot. <laughs> you got a problem with that, you geek? Except that was released in 2005, so they must have added it in later. Anyway. <laughs> they probably did. Am I wrong? You're all going to look back and you're going to go, well, he was right. I'm not going to look back because I'm not going to watch the show again. She was much less hairy than he was. <laughs> Fact. Including her head. Sid did a backstage promo, ranting and raving about all the top names who are coming after him and his title, but he's going to come through it all as champion when all is said and done. Jim Ross brings Ken Shamrock into the ring for a promo. Quickly announces he's going to be special ref for the Austin Hart match. Shamrock's talking about what an honor and privilege it is to be part of this company, part of WrestleMania. Nobody knows more about submission wrestling than myself, he says, and neither man's going to be able to intimidate me. Austin appears on the big screen, cuts a great pissed-off Steve Austin promo, tells Shamrock to shut his hole, threatens to stomp his guts out right now, says it's BS that Brett's getting a title shot before Mania, but I'm cheering for him, because if he wins, that means I get a title shot at Mania. So he's going to quit, make Brett quit at Mania, might knock Shamrock's lights out for good measure. You know, I wish somebody would grab Vince McMahon and, like, tie him up in a straitjacket and sit his ass down. He just for... full stop right there. Tie him up in a straitjacket. <laughs> 24 hours and just make him watch some of this 97 WWF. And just kind of show him Steve Austin and just have him look at the guy. Like, Vince, it's 2016. Do you even remember why this guy got over? Do you even remember? Because you can't make anybody even remotely like Steve Austin today. Just watch the guy do his promos and, and just look at Steve Austin and think about it. And also look at Raw and how it looks exactly the fucking same after 19 years. I don't think he watches any of this stuff. He, his mind would be blown. So Shamrock invites Austin to come test him. Before Austin can accept Brett's music play that he came out, this did not improve Austin's mood. He vanished. And Brett gets down there. And for like five minutes, he doesn't even address Ken Shamrock who's just standing there being polite and patient. Brett says, Finally, after three weeks, they've been nice enough to give me promo time after I lost my championship, after it was ripped off from me again. He sees all the signs calling him a crybaby. Finally, he's getting a title match next week. He vows to win his fifth championship. Then I'm going to beat Austin in the submission match of Mania. Keep my championship there. Starts listing all the men who've screwed him in this company, all the wrestlers, all the referees, Gorilla Monsoon, Vince McMahon. He's finally going to put it all behind him. Finally, he turns to Shamrock and says, Look, I like you. But if you try to screw me at Mania 2, it'll be the biggest mistake you ever make. Shamrock said, I'm not a marriage counselor. I'm not here to listen to your problems. That was a funny line. That was even, a, even Brett laughed. Yeah, even Brett laughed at that one. <laughs> says, I'm going to call this match cleanly, and I'm going to raise the winner's hand. And then Brett starts to say something else, but Austin appears at the top of the ramp. He just shouts and flips them off and goes backstage. <laughs> that was a good promo segment. It was a very good promo segment, and Bret Hart obviously, spoiler alert for those of you following along, He's about to turn heel. And it's such a great setup here. Mm -hmm. He is a crybaby, but he believes everything he's crying about. And if you want to yell at him for crying, he doesn't give a shit. Because yeah. he wants his fucking belt. So <laughs> fuck you. So I have a little wager for us. <clears throat> on the live Raw that uh, is going to be next week's, on the live TV, they let some curse words slip. Mm -hmm. Do they edit it? On the network. I bet no. I bet yes. I'm going to say no, Vinny. All right. Well, fine. No, they don't edit. Craig? Hold on. I'm rethinking this. <laughs> they I, are... think, I think they'll edit it. I think okay, that's what it. I said, you jackass. Yes. I'm okay. So <laughs> you Vinny, can use yourself. He I just, did. I really did. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just making sure. Honky Tonk Man comes out, says the fans want him to sing, but last time he was in the city, they failed to show him the proper respect, so he won't. You know what's great about Honky? When Honky has a date, and he is not required to wrestle, he will use his, his heat to not sing his song. Yes. But if he's required to do a match, he's going to sing his fucking song five times. <laughs> Kill time. Yeah. Remember he'd do that, and he'd come up for Tulalip or whatever, and he'd go, y'all want to hear me sing my song? And he'd sing his song, and he'd be done, he'd go... Y'all want to hear me sing it again? And they don't cheer Yay. and he'd sing it again. Yeah. What a fucking gig. On Sunday, we mentioned Jimmy Garvin is one of the true successful men in wrestling. 
Honky. Honky is also on that yep. list. Yes, yeah. he is. Otto Montoya versus Billy Gunn. <laughs> yeah, he's back after he broke his yes, neck. Yes, he broke his neck and they teased paralysis. Now he's back and magically 30 pounds bigger. Let me remind everybody, he got necked on the top rope in a match with his buddy, his brother, Bart. Mm -hmm. And he goes down and he's absolutely not moving. And his family is crying and people are swarming the ring and they're getting out the backboard. And in the midst of this, Vince McMahon, in the most nonchalant manner possible, just said, that's eh, probably just a stinger. Well, here we are, months later. It was just a stinger. It was just a stinger. We don't know where the fuck he's been. Apparently, he went back to work out the next day. Hell, he sure did. He did a lot of working out. And some tanning. Vince noticed this, that Billy's really getting in shape, putting on some mass. Let's see. Sonny did an inset promo, hyping up her interview segment or something on Shotgun. She was already pushing her future sex tape is what she was doing. I noticed that as well. You know, I hadn't thought of it, but you're right. And uh, Billy won with a top row of leg drop, and that's literally all I wrote about the match. That's all you need to write. You know, Aldo Montoya, are the Portuguese a warring country? I believe it's a jellyfish called the Portuguese Man of War. Okay, that that's, makes more sense. That's where it comes from. I thought maybe they... So just... he was a fish. Yes. He was an invertebrate. Uh, yes, he was just a spineless gel mass. <laughs> okay. Well, that's why he lost. That's a hell of a gimmick. <laughs> I didn't I'll make bet it you up. they didn't tell him that. They may not have. They went, oh, Man of War? But yeah, that means you're a he warrior. He was probably more worried about the jock strap on his head Thank than you. the name... <laughs> You're a soldier. That's Portuguese why we're calling you the man of war. war. Yeah. And in the back, they're laughing. He's a jellyfish. Hey, jellyfish are dangerous. They killed Steve Irwin. No, oh, wait, that, that was, was Steve Irwin. Uh, my buddy Sean was stung by a jellyfish. I'll tell you about it. Said it sucked. Mankind in a backstage promo. This poor guy. God, he, you remember when the crocodile hunter was stung and was killed? Mm -hmm. I have no idea why, but I remember exactly where I was when I got that news. I was outside of a PWG show, and it just ended. You were very sad. I don't know why. I never even watched that show. Yeah. It was I, sad. I remember the next, because the, the, the first time we did a show after, you had been on vacation, or, well, in PWG. Like, days go by, and I go to do a show with you, and you open it and ask, your thoughts on the crocodile hunter? Yeah. Uh, blink, blink, blink. <laughs> I'm sad. <laughs> it was sad for some reason. What well, is it is sad. So Mankind here, he apparently thought he had a minute or two to cut a promo. He had 20 seconds. So he punched himself in the eye to get to make himself bleed, talked about pain a bit, and it was over. No, he just kept going, but they cut away. Yeah. It was like he was <laughs> accepting a Grammy. and they It's like the Observer music. Live. Someone's playing the fucking music, and they just keep talking, and I have to cut him off. What a promo, though. Yeah, it's a great promo. From the 20 seconds we saw. What is the name of the jobber Goldust faced? Ted McNeedy. I was close. Ted McNailer? Needy. Yeah, it Tim, doesn't matter. Yeah, I, did, Tim, I didn't even write it down. Yeah, Tim McNeeny. Is that funnier? McMeeny? McNeeny. <laughs> like a ninny. Hunter and China came out in the ramp to distract Goldust. It actually worked briefly, but then Goldust overcame it and won with a curtain call. And China removed her jacket. She came down to ringside. This distracted Goldust, and Hunter jumped in from behind. And the two heels are putting the boots to Goldust until Marlena charges and jumps on China's back. Seriously, one of the biggest babyface pops in the entire show. Geeks come out to separate them. God, that press slam. China press slammed a ref onto some of the other geeks. <laughs> it was, it was, it was uh, Bruno. Downtown it was, Bruno. Okay, I thought it was him. Jesus but, yeah. Christ. He was so out of control. Yeah, yeah. God, she just picked him up and he's just spindly arms and legs everywhere. <laughs> he just fucking goes flying. That's why, it's, that's why it was him. He looked like a kite <laughs> in a windstorm. <laughs> I see. <laughs> So Hunter reemerged and he grabbed China and pulled her to the back, and that was the end of that. It was time for, as they kept saying, the great debate. There's a podium in the ring with Lawler on one side, Jim Ross is the moderator, and they brought up Paul E. dangerously. And as Paul E's coming out, Vince is, the, is now the only guy in commentary. He's talking about what we saw earlier. He was able to identify Sabu and Taz by name. Dude. Credit to Vince for that. This was so weird because they're there to plug a pay per view. You, and... you would think. Lawler is doing his legit anti-hardcore argument, which was funny because he did that. He was involved in the Tupelo, the brawl that yeah. birthed ECW essentially. But he says, "You fuckers can't wrestle, and so you just use gimmicks." And there are enough brain damaged idiots. Which, by the way, 1997 people are well aware of brain damage from doing stupid shit. There's enough of them to create a promotion in Philadelphia. Well, he's talking about the fans, but. No, he's talking about the wrestlers. Hmm. He goes, there's enough brain-damaged idiots to create a promotion. He says, you draw 1,000, 1,100 idiots, and when we go to Philly, we draw 22,000. 
And why you're here, I don't know, because Vince sure shit doesn't need you. Paul then starts screaming about his 22,000. They've got nothing to do with you. Then they start getting personal. Waller says you should thank your lucky stars you're plugging this pay-per-view here. Paul starts making fun of the crowds he draws in Memphis. He starts making fun of Lawler at the, uh, what do you say? He said, How is it over by the seesaw? Yes. Yeah. Patrolling the seesaws of Louisville, your own sons don't want to call themselves Lawler. That's right. Lawler says you're 35, you live with your parents, your dad funds the entire thing. And it all builds to the deal where there's a brawl about to break out and Lawler is supposed to go and get his guys. And no one comes out. All the whole ECW rosters out there. Sandman, Dreamer, the Dudleys, the Eliminators were out there, I think. And they're all ready to go. And Lawler says, come on out, guys. And then nothing happens. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. So they all yell at each other for a while. Then eventually it just ends. And I'm not sure Heyman ever plugged the name of the pay-per-view, the time, the date, or the main event. I think he threw in a plug for the date. Yeah. I think he got April 15th in. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if This, as, what this was, this was a promo to build to their, I believe it was their second pay-per-view where Lawler appeared. All I know is. But as a, as a, as a hype for Barely Legal, this sucked. All I could figure out, or all I could think when this was over was, Lawler's right. Why did Vince need to do this? What was the point? What did he have to gain? Because they were getting their asses kicked by Nitro, and he was, he was the same reason he had Triple A on the show. Throw shit against the wall. I see. So just get some guys in and... Just put some new faces on there, see if anything sticks. It was just so weird. It was it weird. Was so unvince. But he does weird things when shit's going down. Yes. And then Taker and Sid against Mankind Invader. Have I told you how much I love Sid matches? Yeah. <laughs> He's so horrible. And I mentioned a few weeks ago, he is a goddamn legitimate stiff. When he takes a bump... He, he just lays flat on his back. His his arms and legs are completely straight. And he just lays there. <laughs> it's just so weird. He's horrible. But he entertains me. So they did a hot start, and then Vader puts Sid in a chin lock for about an hour. Vince is thanking the USA Network. For Better than an abdominal stretch. That's true. He can, he can take this move. Yeah. Vince thanks the USA Network for the extra time. Finally, Taker goes to throw a shot at Vader, but he missed and hit Sid, so Taker and Sid start brawling. Taker chokeslams Sid, dives out of the ring onto Vader and Mankind. He's brawling with Mankind up the ramp until Sid comes back to get him. Sid powerbombs Taker. He walks out, and Vader covers Taker for the pin. So now they have shown if Sid can hit his powerbomb on Taker at Mania, then Taker's fucked. Taker makes his recovery, takes out Vader, and heads backstage to kill Sid. And I wrote the show was done, but there's a promo, which actually also happened on Nitro, although this one made more sense. It's a promo by Brett hyping up his championship, na match, championship match next week. He says he's going to prove that the King of the Beasts is not a giraffe. That's what he said. And he vows to beat Sid next week, and that's it. So he compared Stone Cold Steve Austin to a giraffe. No, Sid. Oh, Sid. Sid is tall, you see. I see. I was, I was, I was looking, I was looking past Monday. I should not have done that. Yes, Sid is kind of like a giraffe, but not really. More In like, fact, not at all. Well, no, they're tall. <laughs> He's <laughs> not a giraffe. He, he, did, it. he did flat out admit I got my title shot by crying about it. He did say that. That's what he said. I'm trying to think of what animal Sid would be like. Walking stick. He's not an animal. He's just a giant tree. <laughs> there you go. All right. All right, Nitro. I like that show, by the way. Everybody said that we were going to hate that show. I liked it. I thought it was a unusual but fun two hours. Sure. All right, well, let's do this retro show then. Sure. This is a big, big, big episode of Raw. Can you cheer up, Craig? He looks like he's about to fall asleep here. He's had a long day. Fall into a coma. I worked 12 hours today, Brian. Hmm. I told him he should have skipped this show. I'm very tired. Yeah. Wow. This is WWF Raw number 201, March 17th, 1997. Opened with the Legion of Doom versus Crush and Savio Vega. I love that they are introduced as Road Warrior Hawk and Road Warrior Animal, the Legion of Doom. Can't just call them the Road Warriors? No. No? All right. It's branding. Yeah, because when they 
when they were the Road Warriors in NWA, and then they came over here, and then, oh yeah, now they are the Legion of Doom. I see. So, uh, this match was interrupted constantly by various backstage shenanigans. We got inset promos from Ahmed and Farouk. We got clips from Madison Square Garden of the nation jumping Ahmed and beating him up. They went to Farouk for another inset promo, but he was not there. This goddamn segment sucked. Hold on. <laughs> you know what? I thought of you when they showed Ahmed watching the TV, and he had his back to the television. Dude, I didn't even notice. He had his back to the camera, and he was watching it. The television like a human being. Yeah. Well, thank God no, in no. 2016 well, they fixed that problem. Hold on. And then later, Farouk jumped in from behind, and that's why every diva watches the television sideways. Oh, that's why? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, they're, they're afraid Farouk will jump them with a I don't baton think that's the problem. Hand. Let's talk about what we had here. We had a match. Mm -hmm. We had an Ahmed inset promo. Mm -hmm. We had a Farouk inset promo. Mm -hmm. We had clips from Madison Square Garden. We had another fucking Ahmed promo, which... Resulted in his noted Farouk attacking him from behind with a bat. Russo had to be here at this point. Quite possible. Th this fucking sucked! We know Livewire was around. He was on that show. So. You know that, like, Steve Austin and The Rock and Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart, those guys were all awesome with or without Vince Russo? Let me write that down. And as I watch this show and I see the bullshit that I'm sure this guy was responsible for, because it's the same shit... That we saw in WCW when he went there, and it's the same shit we saw in Impact. It's always been shit. This segment was shit. Why fucking even have a match? They had three inset promos in one match. It would have been four, but Farouk wasn't there. That's right. I could understand a word Ahmed said. No, and I couldn't either. Normally I joke about that, yeah. but the second time, not only is he looking at the TV, but he's not mic'd. And so it's echoing throughout the room, yes. and fucking, I swear to God, I can understand one single word that came out of his mouth. I was so happy when Farouk attacked him. This was so... And what was Ahmed wearing? A giant leather purple jacket with a giant A and a giant J on it. Mm -hmm. The original AJ Styles. Yeah. Fucking Ahmed Johnson. That's his style. This was not AJ's style at all. You're going over the fact he was wearing the purple jacket over... A vertically striped calf suit? Sure. Is that <laughs> it was something that Sable would have worn. Yeah. Say Leotard. Sure. This was, was so horrible. So it led to uh Farouk interfering in the match for the DQ and Ahmed running down and the baby faces cleared house and killed PG thirteen. God, this was horrible. It was so bad. I could not believe it. But I saw it. So on the list of sleazy promotional tactics. By the way, the only good thing about that whole segment was when Ahmed ran out and he attacked Animal or Farouk or whoever it was. I think it was Farouk. Farouk hit Animal with a gimmick. And Jim Ross, the only guy who knows what's going on, screams, he hit him in the kidneys. Because that's Farouk's gimmick. Yeah. He hits people in the kidneys and almost ends their career. Everybody else was out to lunch in this segment. So, they had announced and advertised Sid versus Brett in a cage for the title for this show. They go to the announce desk, where Vince explains there are rumors, rumors, mind you, that the match might be non-title after all, and Gorilla Monsoon is on his way to the building to clarify things. Sure. At the end of the day, it was a title match. So I, I can't complain that much. I get, it's just so silly. Well, they did explain it. There are a whole bunch of Undertaker fans who are so outraged at the possibility that their man may not get a championship match, that they are, they are maybe boycotting is not, the, they're bombarding headquarters with I angry see. letters. I see. And so Monsoon needs to make a decision here. Well, nowhere between wherever he was and this here arena, he couldn't have pulled over, gotten a cell, uh, a payphone. No, he had to come here. In 97. And tell the world to fuck you. Yeah. Which is essentially what he but said. It is pretty close to what he said. Then Lawler said, speaking of rumors, I've heard that Shawn Michaels might be here tonight. All I could think was watching these, essentially, newscasters report rumors. All I thought was, wow, it's 2016 journalism here in 1997. How about that? Nothing has changed. Let me worse. put over Hawk, by the way. One other thing from that first segment. This guy was on fire. He threw three drop kicks in one match. Now, every one of them sucked. But he threw three of them. You he the landed on his shoulder every time, including outside. Yeah, I was going to say, you counting the one on the floor that you could barely see? Oh, my God. 
You wonder why he had problems with pain. Yeah. Hunter Hearst Helmsley versus Flash Funk. For the first time, China was officially in Hunter's corner and identified as China rather than just that woman. And you know what? They explained the China gimmick for the first time here on this show. And I'm not sure if they ever did again. But they explained this woman is as strong as a man. And she can beat the shit out of all the men. But she's a woman. And no one can lay their hands on a woman. I did find that. It's actually a great gimmick. Yeah. Because even though at times she would be evil and deserve some uh, uh, retribution, still the wrong thing to do. And That's Flash, right. And she got in Flash's face and Flash reared back and they said, no, no, no. Can't hit a woman. I cannot believe, by the way, I don't know if they ever had plans for Flash Funk, but the time and pyro devoted to his entrance went forever. Because the chicks were hot. Hunter noted out or pointed out that China was taller than Flash. Very important. Uh, Vince McMahon apparently went... I don't know if it was a gift for St. Patrick's Day or what, but somebody got him the word a day, one a day calendar. Because in one sentence or one, one short uh, short time phrase, he used obsequious and also pompicity. <laughs> Vince McMahon. He also clarified, we're not saying the cage match won't be a title match. Only that Gorilla Monsoon will soon clarify things. There's a funny spot where Hunter tried to catch Fat Flash on his shoulders mid-leapfrog and it didn't quite work, so Hunter just dropped down and slammed him to the mat. Funk appeared to have the win with a top rope leg drop, but China grabbed his leg and yanked him off. Whose fucking idea was that leapfrog in an electric chair, by the way? It was a backwards leapfrog as well. Hunter's like a big swimmer-looking guy at this point. Mm -hmm. He hasn't bulked up yet. No. He's just like a skinny guy. And this big dude's going to leap in the air, and you're going to catch him backwards on your shoulders on your and give him an electric chair? Yes. No wonder you collapsed. Yeah. So Funk was about to go up again when China distracted him a second time, and Hunter hit the pedigree for the win. And they put the boots to Flash afterwards until refs pulled them away. I know you saw the Roadblock main event. You haven't watched the Raw main event yet. The dude's 46 years old, and he's had a million injuries. And I don't want to say he's immobile because he's not. Hunter is a thousand times better worker today than he was here. Yeah. A thousand times. I'm sure that's true. Did you uh, did you see the leg drop off the top rope Flash Funk delivered to Mr. Helmsley? That one and the one he did off the mat right before it. They both looked bad. They He absolutely killed Hunter with the <laughs> one off the top. Just destroyed him. For a guy who... who, who Didn't matter then. I guess not. But for, for a guy he who... was just a fella. Could do so many things. Flash Funk did a lot of things badly. They showed Shawn Michaels arriving backstage. Mini Mankind and Mini Vader versus Mini Goldust and Masquerita Sagrada Jr. Kazuchiko Okada. I saw your tweet. He it, does. I cannot Go deny. on my Twitter right now. I retweeted a side by Sony side. Sony side by side? Yeah. I, I, I could not deny. You yeah. will not believe your eyes when you see this side by side. And he was the tallest guy in the match. He was the tallest guy in the match. <laughs> Which is Okada. He's a very tall man. It is. You will not believe it when you see it. Right, and even Fine, when he does his he does his gold dust thing, and he's essentially <laughs> doing the Rainmaker pose. He is. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> he's the same guy. I am looking at the picture here. That's pretty terrifying, actually. Isn't it? Jesus. All right. And then somebody on Twitter goes, oh, so you're saying all Asian people look alike? Oh, gosh. And I was like, I was unaware that Mini Abesmo Negro was an Asian guy. <laughs> Apparently he is. This match ruled. Oh, man, it was great. This was very, very great. And uh, this crowd had no idea what to make of this sideshow at first. All these short men dressed like the larger men they were familiar with. And, of course, Mascarita Sagrada, who, if you have not seen him, he is tiny. He was at least a foot shoulder, shorter than all the other minis in this match. And then they only had about three minutes, but they provided three minutes of ass kicking. It was awesome. The crowd loved it. They loved all these men. Masquerita Sagrada especially was great. He pinned Mankind with a victory roll. Crowd really loved it. It deserved way more time than it got. And then Sagrada chased Vader up the ramp and had a huge dive off the stage. This tiny man flew through the sky and everyone was pissing themselves. And you watch this and all you can think of is, how did this minions division not become a permanent thing? This was awesome. The best thing is when they both hit the ground from the stage, there was a guy over maybe four feet away. Yeah. He was rigging pyro. Yeah. 
and he like looks over and there's two little people dying in front of him. Yeah. It's great. He had no idea they were essentially no. diving over him. Does his dive off the stage and Vince McMahon screams, What competitors? Unbelievable. And I hit the fast forward 10 seconds because they were just showing replays. And when I skip forward 10 seconds, the very next thing I hear is Vince McMahon again screaming, Unbelievable! It's all he had about this spot. He, he also could only describe it as unbelievable. He also called the matadors yeah. again. They're such matadors. <laughs> These little matadors. Matadors. It was funny once. Now it well, it's still funny. It's actually funnier. <laughs> I glossed over it, by the way. Uh, they did the intros of that match, and then they showed Linda McMahon and The Undertaker. The in... Undertaker. Yeah. And Here. a public appearance in gimmick. With politicians. A governor. <laughs> what? The governor of New Jersey. They were there to I guess celebrates the right word, as Vince called it, the death of a tax bill. Which Vince McMahon would probably always celebrate, actually. This but was the bill that Vince had been trying to get rid of forever, mm -hmm. and he went before he went before whatever in in it was nineteen eighty nine. Mm -hmm. That's when he testified under testified oath. under oath that this is just entertainment. It These matches not. are not real. And it was a huge scandal in nineteen eighty nine. Yes. And here it was, 97, they finally get the thing rescinded. So they bring in the biggest gimmick on the roster. It did. The Undertaker. Yep. Here's a man who's dead, <laughs> celebrating this revelation that wrestling is not real. Yes. And then there was a photo op with probably one of the politician's children. He did not look like he wanted to be there. <laughs> Gorilla Monsoon appeared and said, yes, of course, it's a title match, even though, as he put it, the timing stinks. They talked about Undertaker's fans protesting this was unfair because he might lose his title shot. Vince added, you know, Brett's had plenty of title matches. Has he used some kind of influence to get another match here? And Gorilla said, I did not write fuck you. I wrote up yours, is what Gorilla said. But uh, that was the sentiment. You know, history recalls this WrestleMania match as the famous double turn with Steve Austin and Bret Hart. Mm -hmm. That is revisionist history. It, Bret was, when Gorilla Monsoon said that Brett was going to get the opportunity he so richly deserved, thunderous booze in the building. Mm -hmm. The end of the show, the main event segment, that was a full-blown heel turn. Austin had been cheered forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess it was an official turn, but it's not like Brett went into WrestleMania as the babyface, yeah. and Austin went in as the heel, and all of a sudden the fans decided we're going to switch our allegiance. Yeah. Nothing like that. No. Kevin Kelly brought Brett down to the ring for an interview. Brett said, look, I won the Royal Rumble. I won the Final Four match. I deserve a title rematch, and that's just too bad for the Undertaker. After I win, he can go get in line with everyone else. And he hyped up his Mania match with Austin for a while, and he vowed to win that too. It was a total babyface promo. <laughs> but you could see. Yes. Sultan versus Mike Bell with Rocky Maivia on commentary. My favorite part of this was when Sultan's hometown was introduced as the Middle East. <laughs> yeah. Big town. <laughs> it's very vague. He went 30 seconds. Sultan hit a pile driver, a top rope splash, and the camel clutch for the win. He got in Rocky's face afterwards. Rock was sure to call the IC title the People's Belt. And he was about to start something when Tony Atlas appeared and held him back. And I think Tony got the biggest chance in the entire segment. This Rock fella. He came a long way. He did. <laughs> and you know, listen. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Roman Reigns is the next Rock, okay? But there was a point where The Rock was not The Rock. No. It was on this show. <laughs> He's sitting there on commentary. He's so nervous. He can barely get anything out on commentary. He's sputtering. He just looks confused and worried and nervous. A complete and total lack of charisma. He was a good decent babyface wrestler but look at where he was two or three years later i'm sure that in vince mcmahon's brain he's thinking about roman reigns mm -hmm. and he's thinking you know this rock he wasn't the rock on day one he grew into the role the same thing will happen with young roman but it's it's, it's been two or three years with roman <laughs> i i don't think roman is the next rock no Shawn michaels came out for and a by promo. the way are you sure that wasn't bull dempsey that the sultan was wrestling no. Did you see this man? It was introduced. He looked exactly like Bull Dempsey. Yeah. Isn't this the guy that Saturn would beat up many years later? Yes. There you go. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Shawn Michaels came out for a promo. 
He's much better here than he was last time. Oh, that's for sure. He was much more coherent. Seemed to be in a, a right frame of mind, we could say. He said he had found his smile right where he left it in San Antonio. By the way, my, my uh, network feed here was buffering like crazy. Very annoying. But he thanked the fans for all the cards and letters, for being patient with the world's most emotional wrestler. He thanked the, especially those fans who had sent cards to his parents' house. Yeah. Creepy. The best part about this, by the way, if you look at this promo, this is like a five-plus-minute promo, which is not long by today's standards, but it's a good chunk of TV time. Wasn't his dad like a doctor? I don't remember. He's in the Army is all I know. He was, I thought he was something where he, the people could have found his address or I something. I see. I see. All I know is, that as if this if this was a five minute promo, then Sean spent four and a half minutes of it watching himself on the big screen. Of course, that's his gimmick. <laughs> it's never not funny. There were women weeping over this man in his speech. Tears, actual tears, came out of their eyes. They were so happy to see him back. He said his knee was coming I along. I was too. He I'm was lie. see Doctor Andrew in Birmingham next week. Hopefully, be back in a few months. He promised when he returned, his clothes would be coming off again. Speaking of clothes. What in the hell was Vince wearing? Vince had a... <laughs> like an oversized REI jacket. Yeah, it was no, he was no longer wearing a suit. I don't think he did again for the Monday Night Wars era. He had the red mock turtleneck with the big black almost denim jacket on. Back when they did primetime wrestling, and there was a period between the old primetime and the new Raw, where they did primetime in front of a live studio audience. Oh, yeah. And every now and then Vince would show up in a tank top, it just jacked to the gills. Oh, yeah. Bigger than half the wrestlers. Yes. And it's just funny to see him wearing something that just totally doesn't fit. <laughs> he just <laughs> was wearing this big-ass jacket, just totally obscuring his body, looking like just a dork. I don't want to insinuate anything here, but Vince and Sean were getting along very well Well, in this. it was Vince was laughing at all his little inside jokes, and and then at the end, Sean said, one way or another, these clothes are coming off, and Vince started to leave, and Sean went to goose him. Yeah. yeah. They Inter were interesting. They were suggesting a lot. Yes. And uh, Sean invited himself to WrestleMania, said he'd be doing commentary for the main event, and said he was going to be at the Slammies too. And uh, that was that. Cool. Mm -hmm. He's back. <laughs> they had a shot backstage. It was like four seconds long. Undertaker was trying to destroy the cage. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> his, his, he thought maybe if I destroy this cage... The match will be off. We'll have no match. Huh. And then for sure I'll get my title match. He also thought, I'm a zombie. Surely I'll be able to destroy the steel cage with my bare hands. He should have got a welding torch. <laughs> it failed. Vader versus British Bulldog. Maxi Vader. <laughs> and what, then Lawler was... stole my line. I was, I was so pleased with myself. And it turns out Jerry Lawler thought of it 19 years ago. Bulldog was strong. Just missed it. <laughs> Suplexed this Mastodon repeatedly. Body slammed him. And finally he's going for the power slam when Mankind interferes with the DQ. Owen joins in, turns into a four-way brawl, and Bulldog gets a hold of the urn and clonks Vader and Mankind with it, and that's that. I was so upset with Bulldog not selling Vader's shoulder blocks and clotheslines, and then he picked him up for a suplex, and he held him there. He's strong. Oh, yeah. Bulldog held Vader in a suplex. Oh, yeah. And then at one point, Vader was running at him in the corner. He dove, and Bulldog caught him. Oh, yeah. He was a strong, strong man. I was flabbergasted. Yes. Billy Gunn versus Aaron Ferguson. This sucked. With Ken Shamrock on commentary. Hey, Ken Shamrock on commentary was 100 times better than The Rocket. I firmly agree. He was very, very good. He He's was, very confident. Yes. Spoke well. Good character. Had a lot to say, and, and, and what he said seemed uh, insightful. Except at the end. So, <laughs> Billy Gunn, the gimmick here is, he's fighting this jobber, and he knows Ken Shamrock's watching, so he's, I'm going to show him that I'm a submission wrestler too. So he does like a heel hook at one point, but Ferguson gets the ropes. And then Billy Gunn grabs the man's arm... He bends it the way it's supposed to go. Mm -hmm. He puts one leg over the guy's head and the other into his ribs. And Shamrock says, that's a pretty good armbar. <laughs> and then Aaron Ferguson tapped out to the worst armbar I've ever seen. I wouldn't say it was the worst one I've ever seen, 
but it was up there. I did like the guy on Twitter who was happy that you brought this bad armbar to his attention because he likes holds like this. Apparently. <laughs> like, what? Uh, he says, kind of looks like a... T I, I tweeted out a picture. I, I sent it to our, our friend Filthy Tom Lawler. I asked him for his opinion on this armbar that won a match. And uh, I'll steal Tom's thunder here. He can talk about it when he's on the show later. But he, he replied, I believe the Sage Northcut may tap to that in the future. <laughs> Which is the funniest thing of all time. That was a good so, one. Uh, I did also got a reply. Kind of looks like a top position version of the arm lock Frank Mir used on Pete Williams. I oh. I'm not a student. I I don't know what he's talking about, but I bet he's wrong. Because I'm looking at this arm bar, which bent the arm the way it's supposed to go, and the legs that were giving no leverage at all, and the way the dude's arm was spinning around in this hold. I'm thinking that no, that's <laughs> fake and phony. Well, you know, sometimes you can bend a man's arm the way it's supposed to go, and it's a shoulder lock. Hmm. That was not this. Okay. I wrote uh, that this arm bar was worse than any figure four Hulk Hogan has ever done. That is incorrect. All right. So, Billy gets in Shamrock's face, says, you don't look that tough. Let's see if you can live up to your hype. And he gets in the ring, and Shamrock says, I've never backed down in my life. I'm not backing down from this chump. And he gets in the ring. First that, of all... That name is never not funny when you call a man a chump. Chump. You always tend to forget how enormous Billy Gunn is. He dwarfed Ken Shamrock. He's a huge person. He's even bigger this week than he was last week. I'm sure he was. So Shamrock took him down in a Fujiwara armbar and very quickly released the hold because he's not a dick. He's not going to break the guy's arm. He's made his point. Billy dares him to try something else. Shamrock catches him in a rolling ankle lock and again just lets it go. Let's Billy know I could have broken it if I want to. And Billy snaps and he grabs a chair. The ref holds him back. Shamrock never backs down. And finally Billy gives up and leaves and says this will We'll, uh, what do you say? We'll get it on someday, he says, and this isn't over. That was a good angle. Shamrock is uh, great at this. And then Steve Austin appears on the big screen, and this was awesome because none of these dingbat geek writers today could come up with dialogue like Steve Austin had right here. He said, I am not impressed by Ken Shamrock beating up Billy Gunn. Billy just finished a match. A grueling match. A grueling match. He's overrated, this Ken Shamrock. He's a piece of trash, and someday I'm going to beat the hell out of this guy. But I do want to make sure he calls it right down the middle at WrestleMania. Awesome. Yes. We talk all the time about guys, uh, you know, scripted promos usually suck. Not only was this promo not scripted, when Vince tried to reel him in, Austin was having none of it. Oh, yeah. There were three or four times Vince tried to cut him off, and Austin just steamrolled right through. And he said that uh, he threatened to knock Shamrock's lights out if he screwed up rough in the match. And then one way or another, Bret Hart was going to be champion tonight. And then Bret couldn't lace his boots on his best day. And he was going to beat Bret's ass at Mania. And uh, yeah, Steve Austin was a good promo. You know what else? Speaking about promos here. Up next was Sid. And <laughs> Sid, Sid's had one great promo. It was in the Alamo Dome. Oh, yeah. Everything else he tries really hard. And here, he's just stumbling all over himself. He still comes across as a madman, but he's talking a little too fast. He misses a couple of words. And I was watching, and I thought, you know what? If it were 2016, and this guy was on Raw, he would cut this promo, and some geek would say, Cut! Let's try it again, Sid. <laughs> And Sid would go all crazy, and he would stumble over a line, and the guy would say, Cut! Sid, let's slow it down a little. Let's try to get that line in. And Sid would do about 15 takes until they finally got one where he didn't stumble over any words. And you want to know what? It would be shit. Not because to mention. Sid's a madman. That's the gimmick. Yeah, he would lose his steam, and he would be frustrated, and he wouldn't have the passion delivering it on take 15, as he did on take one. No. Just let the guy go out there and be nuts. If he fucks it up, who cares? He's Sid. Not everything has to be perfect. It's better when it's not. There's a whole... That's Sid's whole career. <laughs> yeah! There, go to YouTube and type in Sid, and you'll see tons and tons of promos that he flubbed. And very comically, too. Yeah, you really want Sid to go out there and just cut, like, a Nick Bockwinkle promo? No. That's what he needed in his career. A nice, slow, methodical, well-thought-out promo with no flubs. Who the fuck wants that? He's Psycho Sid. He should barely even speak English. 
So we got Sid versus Bretton a steel cage match for the WWF title. So it wasn't even a match. It was like an angle. It was it was mm. three minutes of wrestling and then a great angle. Let's be fair. I did like early on, Ross is discussing strategy and he's talking about how Bret needs to go for the legs, get the big man down and set him up for the sharpshooter. Sid, his strategy for Sid was hit a bunch of power bombs. Okay. <laughs> it makes sense when you think about it. So yes, they wrestled for three minutes. Austin ran out and started attacking Sid because he wanted Bret to win. It led to, uh, he was brawling with Sid on the top of the cage. Brett climbed up with them, and they were actually double-teaming Sid up there. Then Taker ran out, and all four of these men were brawling on the top of the cage in one corner. It was pretty scary. Eventually, Austin got knocked to the floor. Brett superplexed Sid back in. Austin took out Taker with a chair. Then Brett was about to walk out the door. He had the match won, but Taker ran over, slammed the door in his face, and slid, Sid climbed over the cage on the other side to win. A crazy spectacle this was, and then it got better. They go to commercial. They come back. They're in the middle of dismantling the cage. There's still like at least one side of it up. Brett is just pacing back and forth. And Vince goes to interview him. He says, Brett, you must be frustrated. And uh, Thanks, JoJo. <laughs> it's not a great question. But what followed was, and there's debate on this, but when, you look, when you're trying to pinpoint uh, what the Attitude Era was, you can just say the late 90s. If you're looking for a starting point, I would argue this was it. Because Bret Hart takes the microphone, he shoves Vince down, and he says, quote, Frustrated isn't the goddamn word for it. This is bullshit. And I have said that word quite a few times in my life. I've heard it many, many more. I don't think I've ever heard anyone use the word bullshit and put so much emphasis into it as Bret did. Bret put his soul into this, cu this curse word. He said, you screwed me, everybody screws me, nobody does a goddamn thing about it. Vince just rolled out of the ring and made his way back to the announce desk. No you know, let me let me cut you off here as you're talking about this, since you mentioned bullshit. First off, I think that the beginning of the Attitude Era actually was Pillman Austin Gunn. Okay. Because there was profanity that made it through on there as well. Mm -hmm. And that was just so wacky. I've said this a million times. You want to know why Brett was great? Everybody, it's, he's great for what everybody made fun of him for. He takes this too seriously. Yes. He thinks he's really winning a belt. Yeah. That's why he was so fucking great. Yes. This guy was going to leave, and he ends up re-signing with WWE for this big deal. And what is he told? He's told, you know what? You lost to Shawn Michaels, but we're going to give you that match with Shawn Michaels at this year's WrestleMania, and you're going to get your win back and get the WWE title. Look what the fuck has happened in the meantime. Sean loses his smile. He leaves. He's now out of WrestleMania. Brett gets the belt and they take it off of him. They're giving him all of these wacky plans. This guy had to be frustrated. Especially, he's looking over at Nitro and all this money these guys are making. And these pay-per-view numbers and these ratings. And he's stuck here on this show that nobody's watching. That gets a 1.9 in fucking Germany. And he's probably pissed off. And he took all of his outrage and he put it in this promo. And that's why he said bullshit, unlike anybody else you've ever heard. He said, nobody in the building cares, nobody in the dressing room cares. So much goddamn injustice around here, I've had it up to here. Everybody knows it. I know it. Everybody knows it. I should be the World Wrestling Federation champion. They show Vince's face on the floor. He looks shocked. He looks angry. And he also looks disappointed. <laughs> Vince was great. He was. Everybody just keeps turning a blind eye to it. You, pointing at Vince, keep turning a blind eye to it. Everybody in that goddamn dressing room knows that I'm the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. And if you don't like it, tough shit. So Austin appears in the big screen. And you mentioned earlier how really by this point, Brett was the heel and Austin was the face. Just needed the punctuation mark. But Austin comes in there and says, Brett, every time you're in that ring, all you do is cry like a baby. You were out there. I was out there trying to help you win. You still couldn't get it done because you're a loser. I do they, have to say that I have a baby and Steve is wrong. They don't cry like this? Ha! <laughs> His babies cry a lot louder than Bret Hart did here when he was ah, yelling about bullshit. I see. So Austin disappears and then Sid comes out to fight with Bret Moore. Bret starts to say something about, you don't know, Sid. And Sid replied, I don't know shit. <laughs> So, Sid and Brett are about to fight, but before they can, Taker comes out. So, Brett wipes out Taker with a dive. Austin comes out. It leads to Austin brawling with Brett and Taker brawling with Sid for a long time. 
Brett somewhere in here punches out Pat Patterson. Vince McMahon is outraged. That dirty, rotten son of a... He stopped himself. Took a great comical bump for it, too. It was awesome. Yep. Vince was begging USA to stay with him. Finally, Shawn Michaels comes out. Everyone goes nuts for that. Shawn surveys the scene. All these men he hates. All fighting for the belt that was once his that he never lost. How about that? Yeah. And he passes them all by. He grabs a chair. And the show ends just with that. So they set up very strongly the two biggest WrestleMania matches. And then seven or eight different directions they could have gone for matches after Mania. He, uh, this segment was awesome. He literally was out there just to be out there. Yeah. yeah. There was no reason for Shawn Michaels to be out there except to be there. To be on television. You also did not mention the best part of this brawl, where Steve Austin and Bret Hart are brawling in the aisle on the ramp. They're having a knockdown, drag out, street fight brawl. And Bret Hart starts to stumble to his feet. Steve Austin, schoolboy's in. I did see that. Schoolboy. Yeah, yeah. Real fight. Yes. <laughs> that was great. So, yeah. I mentioned this last week. This WrestleMania did a... It was a bad WrestleMania. It was bad in the ring, with the exception of the I Quit match. It was a... I don't want to say business failure, but it certainly was not a business success. And here they are, and they've done such a great job building it up when you compare it to the WrestleMania this year. A thousand times better. Funny how times change. We still have two more weeks, Brian. <laughs> but we don't have Steve Austin. What Brett are you expecting in the next two weeks, Craig? More, we're going to get more fucking Shane McMahon punches. Ugh. That is not going to help this build. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Nitro was fun. Not such a fun edition of Raw. No, no. What a horrible show. People complain about Raw nowadays. It's like, you should watch some of these old Raws. Then <laughs> you'll really have something to complain about. I got nothing good to say. Well, almost nothing good to say about this. Raw one. had one good segment, and everything else sucked. The opener? No, the uh, promo. Segment. Oh, the pre... Yeah, the, that was good. Yeah. Dude, the opener was good. Yeah, it was all right. The headbangers right now, what can... Oh, oh really? All right, we'll discuss. I thought the opener sucked. With the bulldog and With the Owen? headbangers. The well, headbangers what the fuck do you expect? <laughs> I expect what I got. A bad match. I thought it was good. Because Owen is great. And the bulldog is great. And they carry anybody. Apparently not. Well, let's go. All right. The announcers this. Oh, Raw number 202, March 24th, 1997, the day after WrestleMania. They announced that Undertaker had won the world championship at that show. And that Mankind was now the top contender. Mankind. They did not explain why Mankind, who had been doing nothing for months, and then was in a tag team match at Mania that ended in a draw, somehow this made him the top contender. Can you imagine, by the way, when you were watching this 19 years ago, that 19 years later, no. this same Undertaker was going to be main eventing and closing the biggest WrestleMania of all time, attendance-wise. Yeah. And Mankind... Would be Santa Claus. Yes. That's what happened. That... That's where history has taken us. It's been a long 19 years, Brian. Bulldog is gone. Owen's gone. Bret Hart had a stroke and then cancer. And The Undertaker is headlining WrestleMania. Yeah. It's crazy to think about. It really is. And keep in mind, this was 97. So it was two years later that all of the wrestlers in WWE were talking about Undertaker's got another year tops. Yeah. <laughs> He's just destroyed backstage. He can barely move. He can barely walk. Here he is headlining. And not only that, if you go online, you can see the videos of Undertaker doing box jumps. Yeah. With a box that's like above his waist, which would mean it's about seven feet in the air. Yes. Nuts. He is insane. So... The opener was, in fact, Davey Boy Smith and Owen Hart versus the Headbangers. It started with Mosh and Owen, and I've never seen anyone get in there with Owen and fuck up more stuff than Mosh did here. They traded double teams for a while. We got an inset promo from the Legion of Doom. They were getting the title shot of the next pay-per-view. And they'd had a street fight the night before at Mania, and apparently they had brought a kitchen sink. And Vince asked them a question about the kitchen sink. I think his goal was to try to get them to crack. But Hawk is smarter and funnier than Vince, and so he turned it back and made Vince laugh. Think about that. Yes. Hawk is smarter and funnier than Vince. 
He said that uh, he didn't like the stainless steel sink. Yes. So they brought out the porcelain one. I see. Got it, Vinny? I, Toilet. I'll, I'll write that down. No, no. It, there's Act, porcelain, porcelain sink. sink. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. It's so. amazing how Home Depot has not hired you as a <laughs> How do you know? I turned oh, down the oh, offer. I know. I turned down the offer. <laughs> I know. It said, I know you've got a history building fences. We've got a job for you. So Bulldog ran into Owen, knocked him off the apron. They started bickering. Owen teased a walk out as they went to break. He came back afterwards. Owen was back in the corner. He was very reluctant about the whole thing. They never really explained why he came back. Change of heart. He walked away. They went to commercial. Mm -hmm. and they came back and he was back. Yeah. Stick to your guns, dude. <laughs> he, thought he, he thought briefly that he overreacted. During the break, you know, they, they show footage of what happened during the break. A miracle happened. The headbangers hit their finish and didn't fuck it up. First That's time right. I've seen that since we've been watching these guys. And let's see. Owen was like half-heartedly reaching into the ring for a tag, leaving Davey Boy to get beaten. Finally, he got the hot tag. Headbangers did a terrible job of feeding him. He was running all over the place. And then Owen and Bulldog kept bickering. Mosh forgot to break up a pin because he sucks. <laughs> and Davey Boy and Owen eventually argued so much that Davey shoved a referee for the DQ. And Bulldog and Owen were rolling on the mat trading punches until refs separated them. I believe this was a title match, was it not? Yes. Yes, it was. They actually won, the Headbangers won a four-way the night before at WrestleMania to get oh. the title shot on Raw. Cool. The reason I bring it up is, so you're in a championship match, mm -hmm. and the other team gets disqualified for shoving down the referee. Mm -hmm. These Headbangers could not possibly have cared less. Nope. <laughs> the other team, Owen and Bulldog, begin arguing, bickering, and shoving. And literally, they stood there on the apron looking at them like, man, what a relationship. I feel bad for those guys. And then they just left. <laughs> yeah, it started actually when they started down the ramp. Owen uh, scooted in front of Bulldog to be first down the ramp. And then Bulldog took offense to this and then uh, skipped and, and got in front of Owen. And this went on and on and on. And it got funnier each time. There's a... There's a bit, X-Pac on Twitter shared this. He's talking about how important it is to get on, A, how important it is to get FaceTime on TV at every opportunity, and B, how wrestling can be a cutthroat business. And he shared a, a clip where someone's getting a promo. It's probably Hunter and DX. But in the background, there's Road Dog, And he's just standing there. But then X-Pac very blatantly steps in front of him. And like a second goes by, and then Road Dog steps in his tiptoes <laughs> to peek over his head. <laughs> anyway. Let's talk about the headbangers here. They were released in 2000 and 2001, respectively. At which point, they apparently did nothing for a decade. But they reunited on the independent circuit in 2011 for the NWO, NWA Ring Warriors roster. They're back together. Now, on the subject of Wikipedia, it appeared to be written by the participants. Yes. There is a whole section here titled... Criticism by WWE. Hmm. Let me read some of this. Please. Years after their departure from the company, the Headbangers have been the brunt of criticism by WWE media. Were you aware of this? I wasn't. I had no idea. One example can be found in a 2007 article in WWE Magazine about the history of WWE champions. The article criticized wrestlers who are considered not worthy of winning a belt they held. The Headbangers were included in this article for their supposedly poor... Tag Team Championship reign. Article suggested the team had the titles by default, since it was, quote, in between the eras of the smoking guns and the New Age Outlaws. Wow. <laughs> what a dark era that is. Although I guess we're in here watching the show. And it also says the 15th anniversary Raw magazine also includes a list of 15 superstars who, quote, overstayed their welcomes in the company. This has <laughs> the headbangers at number two behind only guess. Mabel. Man on a mission, yeah. Scott Steiner. What? Yeah. He was number one. What did that like a year? So that must have been an article that Hunter wrote. <laughs> but it adds here, recently WWE have added the team to their to their where are they now section of WWE.com, putting them in a positive light within WWE history once again. So there is a happy ending. The headbangers, everybody. 
I was going to say, it's not a happy ending. They're teaming again and wrestling more. <laughs> hey, maybe after 10 years off, they've improved. That's true. It's possible. They could have gotten better. So, Owen cuts a promo on Bulldog. Says, I'm sick of carrying you. Everyone knows I should be the European champion, not you. I dare you to give me a European championship match, you gutless coward. And Bulldog cut his own promo. He took way too long to accept. Said it would be Owen's last title shot. He was flubbing all sorts of lines. Said the fight would be tonight. Then he said it won't be, it'll be later. Then he said Owen could get in line for the title shot that he's going to get now. It was a strange promo. Sure was. Mankind did a better promo in the boiler room. He vowed to win the title, but said it wouldn't mean a thing because Uncle Paul was gone. He said he needed his family and begged Paul to come back, adding, don't make me find you. This. Do you remember? Anyway, we'll talk about it when we get to it. Just, I don't want to jump ahead. I see. The fucking end of this goddamn show. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say it again. If you are complaining about Raw in 2016, watch this fucking show. Watch the main event of this show. Which, I realize that Raw today often includes a talking segment to end the show, but usually it goes to a conclusion. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't begin, and then three minutes later they just go off the air. This was the worst ending segment to Raw. It had to be of all time. I can't think of one worse. In the meantime, we got Hunter Hearst Helmsley versus Bart Gunn. Well, we had Brett on the big screen first. Well, Bart came out and then Brett appeared on the screen. Yes, he said he had comments tonight, and Vince warned him, no profanity. Mm -hmm. Now, keep in mind, they got the okay last week for the profanity. But I guess in exchange, or I don't know why, this week you couldn't say anything. You couldn't say ass. Sean got a couple of words in there. Well, they tried they, to get they, it. They bleeped the wrong word. They ble They tried to get in there to bleep out ass. Like I think he said, I'm going to kick your ass, and they bleeped out your. <laughs> yeah. No. Something like that happened. No, no. He got in the... Uh... Yes, Craig? What did he get in? I'll. I'll you know what? I'll save it for his promo. Write it down. Oh, I'll say I it for you. I can't wait. Craig's got to build up it, a head of steam to say this naughty word. I don't know if it's, if it's so foul that he's afraid to get kicked out yeah, of the Yeah, what the hell was so foul that, that it got on TV? I didn't hear it. Did you hear it? <laughs> no. Are you imagining things? No. Okay. Heard... Well, we'll build it up. I Keep bet, going, Vinny. I bet he said bottom. <laughs> Buttocks. All right, so. PP. First of all, Hunter Hearst Helmsley. Wiener. That one was funny. Wiener's always funny. Hunter Hearst Helmsley, much skinnier than Bart Gunn. And they showed him, uh, he beat Goldust at Mania after China had taken out Marlena. We had another inset segment with Goldust. Was this new technology? It may have been. Where, my God, we now have the ability to put an inset in during a match. Let's do 30 of them on the show. I'm not sure Bart Gunn has facial expressions. <laughs> he... He was looking at China before the match, but didn't really react. He made his comeback. It was completely flat and heatless. And then China low bridged him as he ran the ropes. He fell outside. She slammed him on the floor, and he responded by standing up and turning back to the ring. Well, to be honest, she tried to low bridge him, but she didn't get there in time, and Bart had to low bridge himself. I see. Well, her gravitational pull yanked at the top rope due yeah. to her great size of her skull. Well, it's funny because you couldn't tell from the wide shot. But then they showed a close-up of it, and she was five, six inches away from the ropes before she grabbed it, Oops. and Bart low-bridged himself. Let's talk more about this Goldust inset promo. Okay. First off, for those complaining about Raw today, I would rather watch Goldust and R-Truth than these goddamn terrible Goldust segments from 1997. Fucking hideous. Would you rather watch the ones from last week? Hey, all I know is that Something happened with Marlena. She was manhandled again or something? Yes, she yes. was thrown about by China. And so Goldust says next week Ra will be war, and we will never forget the name Marlena. Which history has shown he's incorrect. I'm sure millions of fans have forgotten the name Marlena. He was trying to finish, and Vince was trying to get him to wrap it up and cut him off and get back to the match. I don't blame him. Yeah. So, uh... After Bart no sold this body slam on the floor, China posted him and threw him in the ring, and Hunter went with a pedigree. And uh, I was, I can't say blown away because I wasn't expecting much, but I was very impressed with how bad Bart Gunn was. 
And it occurred to me, and this is a shocking statement, but it's true, Billy Gunn really was the Shawn Michaels of that team. He was. It's amazing. He was. Then we had a match. <laughs> we sure did. Let me read these teams. Venom, Supernova, not that Supernova, and Discovery against Hysteria, Abismo Negro, and Moscow de la Merced. Apparently, forget the I forget the the team name of Venom, Supernova, and Discovery. It was something like the Space Cadets. They mentioned yes. that, yeah, yeah. So we got another, by the way, Bret Hart inset promo because Raw is inset promos, and he's very upset that he didn't get any time. Vince goes, "Don't worry, dude, you're gonna get time later. What do you need time in the middle of this lucha match for?" So they had this match, fun match. Fans had no idea what they were watching. Vince had no idea what he was watching, but at least he was paying attention. But he still had no idea what to say about anything. Last week, the thing that Vince did was, every time there was a high spot, he would scream, UNBELIEVABLE! And he screamed it over and over again, and called them matadors. Mm -hmm. Still calling them matadors. Mm -hmm. But this week, every time somebody got knocked down, Vince would say, Well, that's one way to get a guy down. Yes. And he said it over and over. And over again. It'd be a wacky head scissors. One way to get a guy down. Every high spot. A wacky arm drag. That's one way to get a guy Is down. one way to get a guy down. Was there a high spot they didn't blow? There might have been a few. But they missed a lot of spots. Yes. Yeah. All I know is there were six men in this match. All of them had better facials than Bart Gunn, and five of them had masks. Man, Vinny. When you get on a guy. I do. <laughs> I, I, Remember all the mean things you said about number one Paul Jones and how wrong you ended up being. I admitted I was wrong. When Bart Gunn cuts a great promo, I admit I was wrong. Don't hold your so breath. It'd be a while. Yes. What about when he knocks out Butter Bean? Well, that was cool. He, did not, he knocked out uh, JBL. JBL. And right. Butter Bean knocked well, him out. Yeah, yes. Dr. Death. That's right. Somebody else. But... He had a yeah. facial expression hey. when he got KO'd. Yeah. I'll tell you that much. The funny thing. I'm sure he did it. I think it was just blank. <laughs> we watched it a lot. The funniest thing, at the end of this match, Vince blatantly said, I don't think our commentary did that match much justice. Yes. <laughs> you don't say. And then he got their names wrong. <laughs> that surprises you? That well, was the least surprising thing. It, in that order, that he admitted he was a bad commentator and then screwed up their names. We had an earlier tonight interview with Rocky Maivia and his father, Rocky Johnson. Seriously, it would be like if all of a sudden you just had me as a commentator for a football game. That's essentially what this was, Vince <laughs> calling this Lucha match. You're not wrong. Except I'm pretty sure I could probably do a better job than Vince did here. I was put a wager on it. Let's never find out. That's so. one way to get a guy down. <laughs> after every tackle. <laughs> uh, so, at Mania, Rocky Maivia had been uh, beaten up by the Sultan and his crew until his dad, Rocky Johnson, showed up and saved the day. Who bought a ticket. Yeah, because he, he wasn't sure Vince would give him a free ticket. No, or his son, for that matter. His son's a goddamn Intercontinental Champion. Comps are hard to come by at Mania. Everybody knows that. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Especially this year. <laughs> yeah. So, Rocky Johnson said that uh, he told his story. He had, was not going to miss this show. He bought a ticket. He saw these men attacking his son. Couldn't help himself, but he promised never interfere in my Vias matches again. And they had a hug. Flash Funk versus the Brooklyn Brawler. I will never, I know I say it every week, I will never get over how much time Flash Funk's entrance gets. And then they did nothing with him. He had a total showcase, hit some kicks and a 450, 450 splash and won. Went too long. <laughs> there was a point where he dove onto Brawler to the outside and Brawler was looking at him like, what in the, f you know what I mean? That kind of a thing. No, what do you mean? What you in the what? what? You shut up. Fudge? Move on, Vince. Why do you have to dwell on things? <laughs> Funkadelics. I'm, I'm trying to drag a bad word, bad word out of you. That's my new goal. He meant, what the funk? Because it was flash funk. Oh, okay. Ken Funky was on commentary. Yeah. Wanted to sing a song, and he didn't. He never got to. And he was very, very unimpressed by flash funk. He wasn't wrestling. We went over this the other day. Ken Shamrock did an interview from backstage. Oh, my God. You know what's amazing about this? Ken Shamrock was an MMA fighter. All he had to do was do an interview about why he stopped a fight. 
an MMA fighter. All he had to do was say, the man was unconscious. I had to protect him and make sure that he was okay. And so I stopped the fight. Fucking Ken Shamrock could not spit this out. This was the worst promo since he got here. Yeah. And it was about something that he should have been able to do in his sleep. I did write down this was Shamrock's worst promo yet as he tripped over his lines a few times. He also talked about how tough Austin was. He said, I've fought mixed martial arts. I've been all over the world. And this Steve Austin, one of the toughest men I've ever met. Brett finally got to come out for his promo. As he came out, he was still getting mostly cheers, although that wouldn't last long. He apologized to his fans all over Europe. Japan. Before that, mm. in the most amazing line, Bret Hart came out and Jerry Lawler says, I would love to see Bret punch you right in the face, Vince. <laughs> it's like, you have got to be kidding me. They are determined to convince me by November. <laughs> so the Survivor right. Series was a work. There was a line earlier when uh, Lawler mentioned last week when Brett shoved McMahon down. Vince paused and said, oh, that was an unfortunate incident. And I thought, just you wait, buddy. <laughs> it was incredible. More to come. I remember this promo word for word. <laughs> there was a lot of words. Yeah, that's what's amazing. Yeah. He apologized to his fans all over the world, especially Canada. To the American fans, though, he apologized for nothing. No matter how much he tried, no matter how much he won, the American fans always treated him like he'd lost. He cheered for a creep like Steve Austin instead, and even, even when Austin lost. A creep. A creep. He said, a year ago, I was world champion, and the crowd cheered a pretty boy like Shawn Michaels. I allowed him to screw me out of the title. A man who poses in girly magazines. And then he said, mm -hmm. and this is an exact quote. By the way, I don't think it was a girly magazine. I think it was a gay magazine. That's what he said. It is what he said. Not quite with the passion you did. <laughs> he, for months now, Brian he's been tiptoeing around that. Yes. Brian and finally he could magazines. take no more. Yes. I'm going to tell all you stupid ass fucking fans what I've been trying to say for months. It was a gay magazine. <laughs> Shame on Bret Hart. Shawn Michaels. Shawn Michaels. Well, Bret Hart, as we found out later. Shawn noted. Right. So, he said he got screwed in his title match against Sid. He got screwed in the Rumble. Maybe that's when he should have quit and gone home. But Gorilla and Vince had begged him not to quit and told him to think of the fans. So he came back in Final Four. He was going to get a chance to compete at Mania. And then the fans' hero, Shawn Michaels, had come down with a career-ending knee injury and left to find his smile. And Brett stopped to wipe a tear away from his eye. <laughs> this was <laughs> such an amazing heel promo. Because every last single Thing that he said for the most part it wasn't a gay magazine it was play <laughs> but well well mm -hmm. it is it is true it is a fact that the majority of the audience for playgirl was in fact gay men mm -hmm. but everything he said was true yes but he whined and complained about it and he went on for so fucking long yes. that it was impossible to like the guy it was like Dude, shut the fuck up. Fans were so mad at him by the end because he just kept droning. He decided he was going to tell the whole story. He oh, was, yeah. He was going to go back to the beginning. Yeah, in the beginning. <laughs> fuck you guys. I'm going to tell the whole story, and I'm going to complain about every last single bit of it. They don't make heels like this anymore. No. Well, If you're a heel, don't. you've got to be cool, or you've got to like insult the fans, this, this blatant like the authority, you guys are losers, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Not Brett. Or you gotta be a bumbling clown. Yeah. Brett was right about everything. He was he was he right. He was right in the most annoying manner possible. He he felt he was wronged. Mm -hmm. And he just complained about it forever. Yes. So he'd won the final four. He beat Vader, Austin, and The Undertaker in one night. And what do they do? 24 hours later, they put him in a title match against Sid. But he didn't run or hide. He didn't forfeit titles like Sean. He out wrestled Sid, had him beat despite the boos of the fans. Only for Austin to hit him, hit him in the head with a chair, which is somehow acceptable in America. So he got his title match against Sid. And there was tons of interference. And the Undertaker slammed the door in his head, screwed him out of the title again. Now he's been screwed by the company, abandoned by the U.S. fans. So he did what he had promised to do, beat Steve Austin to a bloody pulp. And still the fans abandoned him and cheered for Steve. 
He said the U.S. fans do not understand integrity or class, would rather cheer for Charles Manson or, Manson or O.J. Simpson. While the U.S. celebrated criminals, other countries still appreciated respect. The difference between, difference between right and wrong. He said American fans could kiss his ass. Vince, I'm getting bored. Oh, come on. This is important. This was a historic. This was the beginning of U.S. Sorry. versus Canada. Sorry. The second time I've heard it today. Got it here 20 times. I'm done now. <laughs> no, let's keep going. So Sean came out. Sean gave the Roman Reigns argument about how the fans pay their money mm -hmm. and they can cheer or boo whoever they want. And then he said, and if you don't like that, well, tough titty, kitty. That's what he said. And he said. Is that the line you're talking about? That's the line I'm talking about. You can't say that on television. Sean did. <laughs> you can't say titty? No, you what cannot. What are you talking about? That's not one of the seven forbidden Look words. Look it up. Titty? You can't say that. Vinny, you look this up, because i got to talk <laughs> okay. about Go for it. the other great irony. Shawn Michaels says, It never bothered me when people booed me. What a liar. And in fact, when he said it, some fan in the crowd, at the top of his lungs, screamed, You're a liar! <clears throat> Very upset. And Shawn finally says, By the way, Brett, how did you know I was in a girly magazine? Couldn't help yourself, could you? And Brett gets pissed off. He turns his back, and Sean throws a mic at him. Mm -hmm. That's the detail that I did not remember 19 years later, and that the announcers totally missed. Yeah, yep. I think Brett might have let him go with the the jab about how you threw him through the pages, but then Sean threw the mic at him, and Brett said, "Fuck this." Yep. He jumped the man from behind, stomped his leg, put him in the figure four around the post. Sean is screaming and crying. A bunch of geeks come out to break it up. This was a fucking titty-licious great angle, is what this was. Why Vince is out there. Sid is out there. <laughs> Brett bails to the back. Why wouldn't have liked it then? <laughs> yes, Vinny? This is just not a word I would have thought of. I would have said, really good. I needed to think of the most profane words <laughs> to describe that angle, and we've now learned that titty... <laughs> Is among them. Well, here are the seven dirty words per Wikipedia. I didn't say the seven dirty words. Not allowed to say the other one on TV. Seven words. You, you just said it. No, you. Well, here's what it says on Wikipedia. Please. The seven dirty words or filthy words are seven English language words that American comedian George Carlin first listed in 1972. Oh. In his monologue, seven words you can never say on television. The words are shit, piss, fuck, cunt. Oh, cocksucker. God, that one's banned from this show. Motherfucker and tits. Ah tits! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I apologize. I get excited when I'm right. <laughs> I had forgotten that George Carlin was in charge of the FCC. Yes. The other detail I want to point out here is uh, <laughs> Sean had a line saying, yes, Brett, we know you would never forfeit your title. Because it took a handwritten note from the Lord Almighty to get the title off you. Well, let's go to the straight Just dope. Air some dirty laundry. Can you say the word tits? Which, by the way, he didn't say. He said tough titty. Right. We don't know if he was talking about a breast. Who knows what it means in that context? You mean like a mouse? You know. There, isn't there a bird? Yes. There's also a mouse. The tit mouse, yeah. Mm-hmm. You're thinking of booby. So this person does say a couple of nights ago, a guest on Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher uttered the phrase tits to kill for mm. and didn't get bleeped, even though it's on broadcast. But on The Daily Show, the host and the guest both said tit and it got bleeped, mm -hmm. which was basic cable. So I think the answer is it's up to the network. Apparently USA is cool with titty. Tough titty. I know I am. There's a... Not tough titty. No. It's the worst. Well, there's a clip on YouTube. Well, I'm sure uh, that's got a lot of hits in England. It just says, Great Tit Bird. Because the English call women birds. Yeah. yeah. All right. Rocky Maivia versus Leaf Cassidy. We got Rock's entrance. They went to commercial. They came back. The match was going on. Brett came back out. He was not done. Sean was being held around backstage. Brett repeated everything he had said before. and said, if you wanted a bad guy, I'll show you wickedly bad. So Rocky wins with his body press, and then Brett leaves him out from behind. And Brett rolls outside and 
Cassidy is just accidentally there. He didn't mean to get on camera, but he was leaving and happened to be where Brett was, was leaving too. And they make eye contact and Leaf just gives him a thumbs up. Let's talk about the real most important part of this match. It is as noted, The Rock versus Al Snow, essentially. They did a spot where they're on the outside and The Rock is leaning against the apron. And Leaf Cassidy goes up the ramp, which is slanted downwards, and he begins to run at The Rock. Got a head of steam from the ramp. And when he almost got to him, The Rock moved, and Leaf Cassidy ran into the apron mm -hmm. and fell down. <laughs> yep. You're not impressed. He was... Now... He was charging with such ferocity. I would like to see that Al velocity. Snow training tape. <laughs> Find out if that is one of the spots that Al goes over. Can you imagine... Ahmed Johnson versus Savio Vega. Terrible. <laughs> it was. Ahmed is horrible. Thank you. Ahmed may be the scariest guy, if you think about who would you least like to work with. Everything he does looks out of control and scary. I would never have a match with Ahmed in a million years. For a million dollars. He did a flip dive off the top rope. If you gave me a million dollars, I wouldn't have a match with Ahmed. <laughs> Literally, for a million dollars, I wouldn't do it. He tried, I guess, a jumping senton where he just leapt in the air and sort of twisted and fell on his back. I have no idea what he's even trying to do. He also looked totally blown up. And he had a huge-ass wedgie. As usual. So, the nation came out and pulled Savio out of the ring. This was deemed a disqualification in what, as far as wrestling matches, was the main event of the show. It's goddamn horrible. Then Ahmed cuts a promo. They gave him a live mic. I believe he challenged any member of the nation to a match where if he wins, the nation must leave the WWF forever. Yeah. Farouk was not here tonight because he had a separated shoulder and, quote, a punctured lung yeah. from the Chicago street fight the night before. I believe every bit of that. Well, Ahmed was He there. worked with Ahmed. Yeah. Even Vince was like, I'm not sure what Ahmed just challenged me to. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine if Ahmed was doing a promo during one of those lucha matches? Vince would know what the fuck was happening. Paul Bearer briefly appeared backstage. He said he did not want to talk to the announcers. We knew who he wanted to talk to. I did not know who he wanted to talk to. Paul Bearer. That's who was speaking. No, Undertaker. I see. No. Well, by the end, we learned I Undertaker. don't know who he wanted to talk to, actually. So they go to commercial, they come back, and then Vincent Mann says the following words. Will you please welcome me? Mm -hmm. Here he comes, the Undertaker! <laughs> <laughs> that was an early attempt at, will you please welcome my guest at this time? Yes. But he fucked it up. Yes. It, now that's why everyone has to say it till the end of time. It may be. So Taker came out and Vince interviewed him. He vowed to fight anyone who tried to oppose him and his fans. His creatures. Yeah. Is that what he called them? Like Jeff Hardy? The creatures of the night? Jeff Hardy did in fact steal that from the Undertaker. He thanked Sid for being a man and having the courage to face him. He promised Sid a, Sid a title shot when his time was due. He admitted that Mankind had given him more trouble than anyone else in the past, but said Mankind had also made him a better gladiator. He said his first title reign was short because he lost his concentration. Lost was his, it the Hogan one before Tuesday edge. in Texas? Yes. He lost his edge in three days yes. or whatever it was? Yes. Wow. The title really went to his head. I guess so. Yeah. It's hard to believe that The Undertaker was there for so long, and it was almost a decade before he got his second yeah. title run. Yeah. Eight years. They either allow him as a top guy without having him be champion. Usually having terrible matches against enormous people. I guess it would be six years. So, Paul Bear interrupted. He said if Taker felt the need to beat him up, he could do what he had to do. But first, I have something to say. Then he got in the ring. Mankind appeared on the big screen, begging Paul to come back. Paul said he had done everything he'd done for Taker, and then the show ended. Mm -hmm. In the middle of everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so bad. Literally, it just got started, and Vince goes, we're out of time. It was really, really weird. Except for the Bret Hart segment, that was a horrible television show. Absolutely. All right, so The Undertaker won the belt November 27, 91. 
And then it was six days until Tuesday in Texas. So then The Undertaker did, in fact, not win the title again until 1997. Wow. Crazy to think about. There you go. That was a terrible Raw. Yeah, let's never speak of it again. And that was the Raw after WrestleMania. That was the, that was the yeah, the famous the, night after WrestleMania the Raw. stage setter. Yeah. yeah. The where stage they, setter for where, what was to come. Where they turn the page and a new chapter begins. Whew. Where were we? Retro we Raw and Retro starting. Nitro? Yes. Shall we begin? Yes, we shall. Okay. Retro Raw, Raw number 203, March 31st, 1997. Over with Owen Hart versus the British Bulldog for the European title. A completely, totally different match than the first one they had. In the tournament final? Yeah. I thought it was better, actually. It wasn't better. It was different, and it was very good. It was really, really good. I have not gone back and watched that tournament final. I remember loving it, Matt, loving it 19 years ago. This is a match where the tournament final was considered a classic. I totally forgot this one even happened. Yeah. This is a good TV match. And it didn't have a finish. No. That, well. There is that. It, no, the match itself did not have a finish. The angle that follows is actually very famous. And much more famous than the match itself. They had a very good match. Uh, Owen was essentially playing the heel. It was actually really awesome. You had a sense that at any point, Bulldog was finally going to make his comeback and kill this smaller guy. But Owen was always able to just, just barely stay on top and just barely keep him contained. Finally, Bulldog made his big comeback. Was this a no disqualification match? No. I guess it couldn't have been because there was, there was a, a, no finish. Yeah. At the very beginning of this match, Owen just kicked him right in the balls in front of the referee. I did yeah. see that. Earl Hebner. Well, there you go. Earl just stood there and didn't call for a DQ or anything. No. Yeah. So uh, eventually, Owen goes to get a chair and... The ref gets bumped, Owen grabs a chair, then Davy Boy gets the chair, but before he can use it, Bret Hart hits the ring, sprinting down the ramp. He tackles Davy from behind, gets essentially the full mount, holds the throat in, in his holds the chair into his throat, and is pointing a finger at him, telling him to stop. Owen apparently thinking Bret's on his side, he goes into attack Davy, but then Bret holds him back. And for about two minutes, Owen and Davy are trying to get at each other and Bret's trying to keep them apart, and no one has any idea why Bret's there at this point. Because Owen and Brett have been enemies for years, as have Davy and Brett, actually. And finally, Brett is able to calm them down enough to say his piece. He says, American TV is full of talk shows where families scream at each other, and that's what these people want. They want us to fight. That's what they've done to this family. Turns to Davy Boy and says, I fought you like a man in England. When it was over, you won, and I gave you a big hug. And we come back here, and they've got us in each other's throats. He turns to Owen, talks about the American fans drove a wedge between them, his very close brother. Says, I spent my whole childhood making sure you were dressed for school, helping you out when you had trouble with kids in school or teachers. You and I were the only members of the family who were really good at amateur wrestling. And Owen, hearing all this talk, all Brett had done for him, weeping. What a burial of his other brothers. Well, <laughs> no one mentioned the... It was not untrue. No one mentioned the tennis shoe cowboy boots or anything, but... uh. Yes, Owen's weeping, his lip was quivering, and Brett said to both of them, he loved them, he needed them, so he'd been there for Owen more than anyone else had been. Owen was just sobbing now, and finally Brett reaches over, he messes up his little brother's hair, and they hug, and then Davy Boy, jo Davy Boy joins in, and Owen's crying, Bulldog's crying, and Brett just looks at the crowd with a mix of disdain, but also satisfaction. That's right. His plan has worked. He has, uh, he has an army. He has a family. This is an all-time great segment. Everyone was tremendous here. Everyone was totally believable from start to finish. And uh, it everyone's motivations made sense. And everyone was it, was... it was authentic and it was enjoyable and it was great. You misspoke and said he had an army. But then you corrected yourself and said family. Yes. He is building an army. He has a farmy. Sure. Yes. The army he composes... Turns into an amazing 10-man tag down the road. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And one of them, by the way, also family. That's true. So, yeah. Oh, you mean the 10-man tag that Brent and I were going to drive up to watch? Yeah, I think that was in Calgary, Long before it? the days of MapQuest. Yeah. Yes. When he convinced me it was a mere six-hour drive to Calgary. Brent Kremen said this? Yeah. And that's you believed him. Four to six hours, he said. That's after the four to six hours to get to the Canadian border? 
four to six hours to get to the border. I'm just thinking like Brent for a second. I know it takes about two and a half. It takes 90 minutes to get to the border. Was it like 14 hours there or something like that? 12? It's about 12 hours. But the point is, I got all the way to Vancouver before I said, you motherfucker, <laughs> pull over. Even though I was driving. Did you think it was Calgary? Oh, never mind. I got a map out and I looked at it and I was like, you son of a bitch. You did this in Vancouver? Yeah! They don't have any maps in Bothell? Well, you know, I thought he knew what he was talking about. Impossible. Hmm. This was the old Brent. So this is on you. This was only when Brent was... I didn't know what I know now. <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> to be fair to Brent. And I've, uh, this is me saying this, trying to be fair to Brent. You and some other friends once said, hey, let's go to that WCW show in Los Angeles. Ooh. And we made it. But it wasn't it twice as far as you thought it was? No, it wasn't twice as far. It just took twice as long. I see. That's but he very different. Here's the deal. I was... 21? Mm -hmm. Okay. For 21 years, I had gone on vacations with my mom and dad, with my buddy Mike Karch, with a whole bunch of different people. And every single time they told me that it was going to be X number of hours, they were never wrong. Uh. So why would I think that this fucking guy would tell me that it was only 4 to 6 hours when in reality it was 12 to 14? Why would I think that somebody would do that? I so, took his word for it. So you didn't know Brent very well is what you're Ex saying. That's my point. That's what I just said. I didn't know then what I know now. I see. That was a long goddamn trip back, let me tell you. I bet it was. <laughs> I'm trying to think of anything worse than spending 12 hours in a car with Brent. 24 round trip. Yeah. And you didn't stay overnight, did you? No, fuck hell no. I turned my ass around and drove him home. I hope you enjoyed the show. They didn't go. Oh, you're from Vancouver. <laughs> yeah. I see. Okay. I didn't make it to Calgary. Okay. I got to Vancouver. We got a map, and I said, motherfucker, it's 11 more hours from here, and you, you shithead. turned around and headed south. Yeah. Okay. I turned around right, right there. I see. I was confused. So, back to Raw. I'm sure he's listening to this right now, giggling his ass off. Of course. Of course. <laughs> it's still not funny, Brent. It's kind of funny. Sunny came out to be a hot woman in a slinky dress. Officially, she was there to do commentary, but really, she was there to be hot in a slinky dress. El Mosco versus Supernova. God. Mm -hmm. What was this? <laughs> this AAA invasion is Bad. so weird. Now, the minis have been great. The minis were great. The full sizers have been hit or miss. Yes. A lot of, a lot of both. Mostly miss. Yeah, a lot of... Spe and either way, spectacular. Spe <laughs> it's a spectacular hit or a spectacular miss. Let's talk about the real important thing here. It was Sunny. Sunny sits down, and she begins speaking Spanish because mm -hmm. there's luchadors in the ring. And Vince has no idea what's going on. And she says, Vince, buenas noches. You know what that means? And he says, yeah. <laughs> and she calls bullshit. And she says, Vince, what does that mean? Buenas noches. And he hems and haws. And finally says, could I have a drink of water or something like that? So Sonny decides, I'm getting the fuck out of here. I'm going to go talk to the Mexicans. I'm speaking Spanish. So she goes over to the Spanish announce table. And they totally mark out. And they're grabbing her. Someone's paying attention to us. Pawing all over. Hugo Savinovich has got her on his lap. Hand on her hip. And any other guy, I can't remember his name. Cabrero or something. What's the other guy's name? Hugo Carlos. Savinovich and Carlos Cabrero or whatever. Right, yeah. Carlos decides he's going to ask for a kiss. Why wouldn't you? And she responds, and I quote, a kiss? Give me one good reason. And you know what his response is? Never mind. <laughs> well played, sir. Well played. No, not well played. <laughs> He wanted a kiss, right? and she said, give me one good reason. Sure. At the very least, come up with one fucking good reason, because maybe it's good enough. Instead, he folded. Yes. As soon as she said, give me one good reason, he was like, I'm out. He didn't Lost have a his chance. So literally all the commentary was uh, jokes about speaking Spanish or talking about other matches. The only spots Vince called in this were the botches. I find if Carlos Cabrera is married, he's got to be single. They, they do like a drop kick and an arm drag and a body press. And he wouldn't call any of that, and they'd screw up a moonsault, and Vince say, "Oh, he missed him there." So, 
La Mosca finally won, or El Mosco finally won with a uh, Jeff Hardy, what do you think? No, a Sabu style sitting moonsault. There you go. Brian is feverishly looking on the internet to see if Carlos has any play whatsoever. Jim Ross brought the Legion of Doom down to the ring for a promo. Animals, Animal said in the NBA, they recognize the Chicago Bulls because they're the basketball champions. And in baseball, they recognize the baseball champions. He had no idea who they were. By the way, just in the interest of fairness, Hugo Savinovich and Carlos Cabrera were not Mexicans. Carlos Cabrera was from Colombia. Oh. And Hugo Savinovich was from Ecuador. Wow. But they knew Spanish. Yes. They were the Spanish announce team. One way or the other, Carlos Cabrera could not come up with a good answer. And there's no information on his Wikipedia as to whether or not he is married. So they're talking about winning the belt at the pay-per-view, and Hawk is making his usual cartoonist silly threats. He asked the fans, do you like it so far? And they kind of said, yay. Then he said, oh, what a rush. Then it ended. This is a weird promo. Real Double J versus Jerry Fox. Jerry Fox. Mm-hmm. Pretty sure they used this jobber twice. I'm sure they did. If this is a taping, they probably used him six times. What do you mean they used him twice? On the show? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Oh. Because that's how interchangeable he was. No, but this guy looked exactly like the other jobber in the uh, Savio and Crush match. Jobbers should be generic. That's true. Yeah. So Honky Tonk Man was there doing commentary. And then Real Double J came out with a six-year-old boy as his guest manager. Nathan Arnold. And this young man comes out with his hands in his pockets, staring at the ground, very, very shy, wants no part of dancing with this guy, wants no part of being on TV. Very awkward this was. Honky is clapping his hands and bobbing his head to Real Double J's music. <laughs> oh, he was? He was clapping his hands and he was bobbing his head. Not to the music. That's actually true. You've never seen a man with worse rhythm yes. than the honky-tonk man. <laughs> yes. He said he was still searching for his protege, but... Double J was at the top of this list. He told Mike Mann. <laughs> you Mac, call him Mike Mac, Mann. Mac Mann. Mike Mann. At least once it was Mike, Mike Mann. Mann. Okay. So they had a squash match. Which is very important, by the way, for later. Sure. Jesse James won with the greatest move in all of wrestling, the pump handle slam. <laughs> that was Vinny's finish, everybody. Yes. Yeah. Which, believe it or not, he actually utilized in a few matches. I actually won once or twice, yeah. Wow. It's true. You know, it just hit me that you did win some matches. Yeah. I had this vision of you losing every match in your career. I counted a lot of lights. But then I realized... Actually, actually, I counted a lot of open sky as well. I should have known because you beat me. Beat you at least once. How did I think, you I win? think it's the one time. I went for the figure four, you small package. Yes. I wasn't about to take I'm, your pump handle It's slam. quite possible I never hit you with that move, but you countered it about 800 times. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm positive I, I never took that I move. I believe I'm 0 for 800 on hitting that move on you. Yes. He never let me do as a Mitch Snooker driver on him either. Oh, weird. Oh, yeah. I'm sure I did. No. Yeah, I no, think no. so. At least no, no. that's... Hey, I understand Because I would have trusted you because you did it like a slam. That's true. And I knew you could lift me. I, also, I, I should lift say. you. I wasn't so sure about that, Vinny. <laughs> Vinny. You were 150 pounds. Not at the time. I was as big as 196. Oh, a titan. That was junior high weight. Oh, God. Anyway. <laughs> so, Honky hits the ring. I'm going to put 196 on a bar. I'm going to have you lift it next time we come here to this show. <laughs> have you deadlift 196 pounds. See if you can do it. We'll see what we can do. Honky hits the ring. Says, you and I would be a great team. You could follow me in airports and carry my guitar. We'll dye your hair black. We'll grow you some sideburns. He says, this guitar. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm glad you mentioned the line about how you could carry my bags. Mm -hmm. Because I missed that the first time. All I heard was him say, we'll grab some sideburns, we'll dye your hair, and I'm going to give you this hair loom. Hair loom, he says. By the way, when Honky came down with the hair loom, he set the guitar against the announce desk, and it completely slid off the floor and hit the floor hard. <laughs> well, it could have been that hard. But uh, anyway, Honky gives the hair loom to Double J, who looks moved and humbled. Honky then asks Jesse to consummate this deal. Going to fuck the guitar? <laughs> I guess. Jesse finally speaks up, says, I'm breathless for a couple of reasons. He did fuck the guitar. <laughs> he said, Honky, you're the greatest Intercontinental Champ of all time. I know how important this is to you. Honky says, it's true. They won this guitar in the Hall of Fame and in hamburger restaurants all over the country. 
That's what he said. And Jesse says, I know what to do. And he smashed the guitar, guitar into the mat. He walked away. He told Honky to kiss his ass. Because this real Double J thing is really catching fire. See, that's why it was important that you mentioned that he wanted him to carry his bags. Because if you take that out of the equation, Road Dog was such a cock. <laughs> All Hunky wanted to do was give him a hair loom, and he proceeded to destroy it. Yes. But now that you add that Honky essentially wanted him to be an indentured servant, yeah, then it makes sense. A lackey. Yeah. He wanted a six. Fuck that. No man should be another man's lackey. <laughs> Don't look at me like that, Vinny. <laughs> Crush and Savio Vega versus Rod Bell and Adam O'Brien. Vinny, that's how the business was in those days. <laughs> I'm not complaining. It's very different now. By the way, I watched a little bit of Ride Along with Miz and Dolph Ziggler. Why? Well, to be honest, uh, I was on Baby Patrol. I see. For another 15 minutes. Okay. And I was like, what is on the network? And I thought, what the fuck? Could it really be that bad? Or how bad could it be? It was fine. All right. It didn't bother me one bit. How were Ziggler's jokes? They were horrible. They didn't okay. really tell any jokes. They were just sitting there like... That's what you I mean, do on the ride-along. They were talking about stuff that nobody could possibly care about. They were just chit-chatting with each other. They were just shooting the shit. Okay, now I'm intrigued. It was kind of it's intriguing. Actually... I was like, they weren't annoying like on television, but they weren't intriguing in any way. Hmm. Like, Miz was having conversations about how... Man, when I was 21, I thought it was so cool, and I want to stay out and drink all night. And now I'm old. I just want to go back to the room. And That's Dolph goes, me too. I'm old. Well, <laughs> I was like, there, there's a conversation about this. Maurice is at the room. I would go. No, she's room. not. She's at home. That's true. He's going back to his own hotel room by himself because he's old. And this, I, this to them was an intriguing conversation. Yeah. If I were Miz, that would be my lead-in for every conversation ever. Mm -hmm. I sure do miss my wife, Maurice. <laughs> yeah. Here I have an 8x10 in my back pocket. Yeah. Sure. He was he was making sure to get her Instagram all over the show. Oh, good. No, good. So, Crush and Savio Vega versus Rod Bell and Adam O'Brien. Shawn Michaels did an interview via telephone in which he said, essentially, I'm not going to talk on the phone. I'll be there next week. Mm -hmm. O'Brien actually got to make a comeback here, believe it or not. Crush cut him off with a scary suplex and a tilt a whirl, and they won with the demolition elbow. So, these guys are heels. And so Lawler made sure to bring up, these are those Americans that Bret Hart is talking about. And the other announcers had no comeback. They were, in fact, Americans, and they were assholes. Well, Crush is. Sure. So I'm just, well, Puerto Rican. Yeah, I guess it counts. What was up with the press slam Crush tried to perform on this man, but he didn't get him up, and he just dropped him behind his head? Because he sucks. He's Crush. There Fair was enough. a point. There was a point where Savio tags Crush in, and he takes whichever job he's got, and he holds both his arms behind his back. And Crush steps in, and there's... A thousand things he could do here. And he appears to be absolutely paralyzed with choices. And he looks at the guy and looks at the guy and looks at the guy. And finally, there's a headbutt to the sternum. And this keeps going. We had a Ken Shamrock highlight video, which is mostly him throwing around Billy Gunn and Bret Hart. And he promised Shamrock would do a no holds barred exhibition next week. Can't wait for that. The second hour pyro went off. And Vince McMahon shouted, quote, <laughs> explosion, contusion, concussion. I don't know why. Things change. Paul Bearer came out hoping to reunite with The Undertaker. He had his own wacky, spooky theme song. He says that he had let The Undertaker free so he could find himself, and now Taker was WWF champion. And in fact, he might have been champion long ago if Bearer had not been the one holding him back. He begged Taker to come out and greet him face to face so they could talk. Taker obliges. He stops and locks the casket at ringside first because he doesn't, does not trust this guy. And by the way, I now know what you use to lock a casket with. It's a simple Allen wrench. You can get it at IKEA. He probably got the casket at IKEA. Fair enough. I'm not sure they sell caskets at IKEA. Probably deep in the warehouse somewhere. Maybe not really much of a concern about people stealing what's in your casket. That's what I mean. Maybe in the scratch and dent section, I have a casket over there. Anyway, so uh, Taker delivers a very hokey promo. I can <laughs> by what standard? Well, <laughs> Undertaker standards. Yeah, you're right. He, he cuts a promo as hokey as every other Undertaker promo ever. That's true. He can for he can never he can forget not betrayal, forget betrayal, but perhaps he can forgive it. That's right. My thoughts have been consumed with you for a week, Paul Bearer. 
For years, we laid many people to rest. Perhaps it's time to get back together again. This guy's name was Paul Bearer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just want to throw you that just out. got that? No, I, <laughs> the, I, the I knew it. You. I knew it, but you're talking about hokiness and Undertaker. Well, yeah, it's okay. like, come on. If you wanted to go with not, hokey, you should have seen the eye makeup these two were wearing. There was a lot of a lot of eye makeup. His though. gimmick was he was a dead guy right. called The Undertaker, yes. managed by Paul Bearer. Yes. Nothing's hokey about this after that. All right. Apparently, Paul doesn't sleep. <sighs> so Taker kisses the championship belt, presents it to Paul, holds it out to him, and Paul responds by snatching it out of his hands and celebrating like crazy. And that was awesome. Mm -hmm. Because this was this was Taker testing Paul. If Paul is really, if he's sincere, he's not going to take this belt or the, the least he's just going to present it back to me. No, Paul snatched it out of his hands like a dick, like he'd be the one to want it, win it. He like ran in place for a second and giggled. Yes, yes. That's awesome. And then Paul turns around and Taker drops him with the right hand. Then, for about a minute, we got a zombie slowly stalking a fat guy around the ring and up the aisle. And I do mean about a minute. This is the slowest chase you've ever saw. Mankind appeared from under the ring and threw a fireball in an Undertaker's face. Old school. Very old school. And it's kind of amazing. I watched this a few times, and they showed it many times on replay. Mankind you know, comes out of the ring. He's ready to throw the fireball. And Taker had the urn over his head and was going to crush Bearer with it. And he turns, he drops the urn, and he actually grabs Mankind's wrist. All I can think was, if I had a guy who I knew was about to throw a fireball into my face, the last thing I'd do is try to throw off his aim. But anyway, he's fine. And Taker sells this like crazy. He's thrashing around, he's blinded, he's in agony, he's throwing blind punches at referees. Sid appears. He chases Bearer and Mankind away. It did not take him long to pass Paul Bearer. Literally passed him by and is chased after, after Mankind. And uh, Taker was still stumbling through the crowd as they went to the break. So they go to commercial and they come back and Sid does a promo saying, Mankind, you have made a mistake messing with The Undertaker. I will admit that at WrestleMania, on that one night, Taker was a better man than me. But Mankind, Taker will always be a better man than you. And I just like that last week, Sid was the one who saved, uh, saved Sean from Brett. This week, he saves Taker from Mankind. Sid is now just the universal policeman. Sid, Psycho Sid, the voice of law and order. Cool. Yes. If you're going to have a lawman, not a bad one to have. He'd be a great sheriff. You know, I think the story was that when they were putting together Nitro, the lineup included a Debbie Combs versus Akira Hokuto match. Yes. And I guess they were just looking at the lineup and they said, well... Probably are going to lose this quarter hour. Debbie Combs and Kira Okado. And then somebody else said, well, I guess our one hope is that on the other channel, they'll put Sid on the air. And sure as shit on a live show, opposite Akira Hokuto and Debbie Combs, they put Sid on the air. And Nitro won. <laughs> huh. Apparently, Sid was not a big TV ratings draw, which is astonishing to me, because he's a big draw to me. So after seeing The Undertaker, we then get Hunter Hearst, Helmsley, and Goldust. Ah. Uh, 20 years later, these guys are still around. Dude, 20 years later, they'd have a better match. Well, yeah. I actually wrote that down. I would like to see these two have a match today. It, this was no good. It was very boring. China and Marlena were theoretically barred from the match. But then China appeared on stage. <laughs> this is one of the big things they used to always do. So and so is barred from ringside, mm -hmm. and they just come down. They just walk out. And there's never any consequences. No. The worst consequence was they called for the bell. She walked out, and Goldust hit his finisher, and China attacked him for the DQ. She hit a spin kick, and she managed to not fall down. But there's a reason she never did that again. It's a classic green woman move in WWE. Lana, it China. Is. Yeah. Throw some wacky kick and get your leg high up in the air. And that was the last time you ever hear Lana and China in the same sentence. <laughs> a melee, maybe, maybe not. We'll see. A melee broke out in the ring. Hunter decked Pat Patterson, who fired up and made a big comeback. And this led to China doing a roar spot with the refs. Must we downplay this to that extent? Pat Patterson he stole had that. the best comeback of anybody on the entire show. Yeah, he stole this match. Holy smokes. Pat Patterson was great, it's true. Yeah. If you... It, if you have never seven years old at the time, 
If you've never actually seen Pat Patterson wrestle, you owe it to yourself to go back and watch some Pat Patterson matches. Pat Patterson fired up and was throwing punches at Hunter. I was like, can Hunter go back and be an agent right now and Pat Patterson can be here working matches in the ring? Yes. He was great. And it led to China doing a roar spot with the refs, which always gets a thumbs up from me. And she went after Patterson, and Goldust eventually recovered, and he took out Hunter, and Hunter left with China, and that was that. In a big stare down with Goldust and China, and Vince brought it up again. Goldust just can't hit a woman. It is such a great character. Yeah. You have a huge, jacked up woman who's bigger than half the men. He beats the shit out of all of them, but at the end of the day, she's still a woman. And a man is not allowed to hit a woman. McMahon the whole time just salivating. Look at the shoulders. Look at her traps. Oh, my God. Just on and on and on. And, at least it was uh, a woman he was fawning over this time. That's true. It's usually the men. And uh, and Jerry, throughout the, throughout the uh, show, was moved to tears. And actually, there was an argument over Kleenex during this match because... He was so moved because of the Heart Foundation at the beginning of the show. Yes. It was ridiculous. <laughs> he was a ridiculous character. If Jerry Lawler is Jerry Lawler... <laughs> if Jerry Lawler's about one thing, it's family. Oh, yeah. Because... Yeah. Right. By the way, he had an amazing podcast with Chris Jericho a couple weeks ago. I'm sure that's true. One of the weirdest sentences I've ever written for this job. Vince McMahon brought Steve Austin out for a promo. That's right. So Austin says he never quit at Mania. And Brett couldn't even take credit for beating him bloody. Because the blood had come when he hit the guardrail. Nothing Brett did about it. And that's why Austin blacked out. Because he was losing so much blood. It had nothing to do with Brett's little sharpshooter. He said the fans could boo him against a good guy or cheer him against a bad guy. Either way, he was whipping someone's ass. And he called Brett down to take another beating. Brett shows up on the big screen, says, look, I beat your ass at Mania whether you like it or not. You hit the guardrail because I threw you into it, which is a strong point. And he said, I'm finished with you. And Austin said, you're going to have to kill me to finish me. And he vowed to be beat Brett 10 times bloodier than Austin had been at Mania. He said he's going to stand over Brett's grave, which would say, here lies the biggest crap, biggest piece of crap to ever walk the face of the earth, and he's lying here because Steve Austin beat his pink and black ass, which would actually be one hell of a tombstone. I don't think that's going to be on Brett's tombstone. I may want it on mine, just because. <laughs> just because it's so great. As usual, Steve Austin cut a great promo. He did, but you know what? So everyone talks about the Mania match, the I Quit match. We've already talked about how the double turn wasn't really that much of a double turn. Because Austin was already pretty much a babyface going in, and Brett was pretty much a heel. Well, here we are. This was the first post-WrestleMania interview by Steve Austin after that blow-away match where he refused to quit and went unconscious, and it was a famous double turn. He did not get a blow-away reaction here. No. He got a mix of cheers and boos. The fans still were not 100% behind this guy. It had been almost a full year since the King of the Ring, where he did his Austin 316 promo. It's a long goddamn time that this has been taking. Sometimes a guy gets over, you do, you shoot an angle, you debut a guy, whatever, and he gets over immediately. And sometimes it takes a long-ass time. But if Vince would have given up on Steve Austin in June of the previous year, or if he'd seen the reaction here after WrestleMania and thought, Goddamn guy isn't over and gave up on him. There would have been no Steve Austin. It took a while for him to become Stone Cold Steve Austin. We're going on a year now. And that's why we need to get pushing Roman Reigns. Hey, you want to know something? I'm glad you brought that up, Craig. Okay. I was going to talk about that in the match with The Rock, but I'm going to talk about it right now. This Rock guy, this was The Rock in there with Bret Hart. It was Rocky Maivia, Brian. It was The Rock. Call him what you want. And the reality is, nobody cared about the guy. No. They didn't care about the guy one bit. He He's joined, the intercontinental champion. He hadn't joined the nation of domination yet. Nobody cared. And you know what? Roman Reigns today is so much more charismatic. He's a better worker. 
and he's a better talker, and he has better presence than The Rock in this match with Bret Hart. Fair. Which is probably why Vince McMahon today is sitting there going, look how The Rock turned out. Now, granted, Roman Reigns is not The Rock. No, he's not. But it took a long goddamn time for The Rock to become The Rock. And the Roman Reigns is farther along today than The Rock was back then. And that guy, this dingbat Rocky Maivia, who was such a failure at the beginning in this match with Bret Hart that the people hated and wanted nothing to do with this, he became the most charismatic guy and the biggest star. So push Roman Reigns. Why not? Got nobody else. Now, one other thing. What Stone Cold Steve Austin, what did you wrap up with? Uh, do you do the bottom line catchphrase? And that's the bottom line because Stone Cold said so. You know what that's very similar to? It's very similar to, and you can believe that. It's Roman Reigns promo. But you know what? The difference between Roman Reigns and Steve Austin is striking. <laughs> Tell me more. Like, I wish Vince would really go back and watch some of these old shows. And, like, take a good hard look at the Steve Austin character and the Bret Hart character and then look at what he does with Roman Reigns. And maybe things would be a little better if he stole some of this stuff from back then. I don't want to hear about how audiences are different and it's a PG era. This Bret Hart would have been over huge today. And this Stone Cold Steve Austin would have been over huge today. Not this geek Roman Reigns who looks all nervous when people boom. Steve Austin did not give two shits whether he was booed or whether he was cheered. He flat out said in his promo... I don't give a shit if I get put against good guys or bad guys. I don't care if you cheer me or boo me. I don't give a shit. Meanwhile, whether he means to or not, when Roman Reigns goes out there and everybody boos him, he looks so sad. And you know what happens when you look sad when the people boo you? They do it more. They fucking can't wait to do it even more. That's his biggest problem. They're real life trolls. He sells it too much. Unlike Steve Austin. Anyway. So yes, the main event was Bret Hart versus Rocky Maivia. Bret Hart versus The Rock. A, a dream match that no one at the time realized was a dream match. Because it wasn't. No, this is not good. It was an average TV main event. I want to know how it's possible. I know the answer, but still. Rocky Maivia's mom was Samoan and his dad was black. Bret Hart, Canadian. Not just white, but Canadian white. Somehow they have the exact same skin tone. It's called a tanning booth, Finny. Bret spent a lot of time in tanning booths. So Bret... Started this all even, but as soon as he got the heat, suddenly he went into heel mode. He's raking his eyes in the ropes and scratching his eyes with the boot laces. All the dick moves he can do. And Rock makes his comeback. He hits the flying body press, but Brett, Brett rolls through for a two count. And he lures Rocky into the corner, hits a nut shot in the ring post figure four, and gets DQ'd. Austin then appears. He attacks Brett, but as soon as he's there, Owen and Bulldog are there to jump on his back. And they are triple teaming Austin until the Legion of Doom arrives and chases them away. And that was that. It was a good show, thanks almost entirely to the Heart Foundation segment. Okay, they showed Tony Atlas at ringside yet again in this match. Mm -hmm. Does it lead to anything? I don't know. I okay. can't remember. All right. They said he was no longer allowed to interfere in his son's matches. Or not, no, Rocky. Well, they're can't. talking about Rocky Johnson. Yeah, Tony. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what Tony Atlas is doing. Okay. I, I, yeah, I have no idea. As far as I know, he disappeared after this and didn't show up again until he was teaming with Mark Henry in ECW. Ten years after this. Fifteen years after this. Rocky Johnson interfered at Mania. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what Tony Atlas was up to. It's the second time he's been on the show. Well, maybe it does lead to something. I would hope so. You know, there's this source. Yes. Called Wikipedia. Mm, it's always right. But usually it's not too bad with history unless it's a... Attendance. All right. -a. It says he briefly showed back up in the WWF around WrestleMania 13 being spotted in the crowd and cheering for Rocky Maivia. And then Atlas was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2006. So the answer is it led to nothing. Hmm. I'm glad they it led to him going in the Hall of Fame 10 years later. I'm glad they've made note of it on two different shows for absolutely nothing. Well, you know, there's a lot of things they made mention of that led to nothing. Which leads us to Nitro.